Good evening and welcome to the 328th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and the history of text and image work. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And tonight is our annual Will Eisner Week event. And this uh, time it's comics and sequential art. Will Eisner, teacher and mentor. It will be a panel discussion with Brian Michael Bendis, Emil Ferris, Dean Haspel, and Jennifer Hayden, moderated by Danny Fingeroth. Danny is the chair of Will Eisner Week and is an author and historian whose latest book is A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, currently out in paperback from St. Martin's Press. Fingeroth was a longtime writer and editor at Marvel and is the author of Superman on the Couch, What Superheroes Really Tell Us About Ourselves and Our Society, and disguised as Clark Kent, Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero. So take it away, Danny. And Thank you, Ben. Thanks for coming. Oh, this is a, it is, a, I was just uh, thinking, it's too, too, I'm going to get in, I'm going to start, I'm going to start uh, with some real world stuff, but then it's two years since the COVID. Ben, was that you were, you were a big part of, 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 of the pre-COVID, right. right? I mean, because just before the COVID, we did the last live Will Eisner Week event <laughs> at, mm-hmm. at Parsons. And then, uh, you know, like a week, literally the night before the shutdown, uh, you and um, Fran Leibowitz did a terrific mm-hmm. event uh, promoting that, that the, your, your book, The Dairy Restaurant at the Strand mm-hmm. Bookstore. Needless to say, everybody in the audience was in a high risk group, you know. Yeah, it was like... she, she was not happy about being there, but she did it anyway, but you know. Nobody knew what was going on. It was just the, the, the day that every institution in New York closed down, except right. the Strand. It was their last event. So. Strand and a little Poland restaurant was open. Yeah. yeah. Eating, uh, <laughs> eating dinner there. Yeah, anyway, um, I don't know what it yeah, was. All right, but um, this is the, um, I guess we live in very bizarre, challenging times because this is the second time that I've kind of hosted a comic graphic novel event in the middle of, you know, the world maybe blowing up. So it's a surreal kind of thing. And you all know these strangers of the world. And I guess the only thematic thing is that Will Eisner cared about what was going on in the world and, and what made things happen in politics and sociology and uh, war and conflict. So, um, you know, I guess we are, we are here in, in, in a Will Eisner tradition trying to process, deal with, and, and, uh, and, and see where he and his work and his legacy fit in. So sorry for the bummer of the beginning, but I thought there was sort of an 800 pound gorilla that we could not uh, avoid. So now let's have fun. Um, anyway, um, so as, as, uh, as Ben was saying, this is part of Will Eisner Week, of which I am the chair, I am not the desk, I am, I am not the ottoman, I am not the refrigerator, I am the chair of Will Eisner Week, um, through a clever mix of uh, nagging and, uh, and annoying and cajoling, uh, I have helped uh, Carl and Nancy Gropper of the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation grow this to close to a hundred events worldwide and, you know, at universities, uh, libraries, bookstores, comic shops, online. Um, and so this is, is, is part of that. This is the first day, Will Eisner week. Um, we're very liberal in our definition. We've, not, we've been known to have, although Will Eisner week is, Will's birthday was March 6th. And uh, we've been known to have events into April. So um, check out uh, willeisner.com and also the Will Eisner Week um, 
Facebook page to find out more about uh, many other events. There's also, uh, there'll be a link there to the Will Eisner Week uh, YouTube videos uh, where we have some incredible people, um, Todd McFarlane and uh, um, uh, Brian, Brian, did we get, did I, did I snag you for one of those? No, I got you, I got you for some, a lot of Todd and, um, and of course I'm blanking on people, but this incredible lineup, I'll, th I'll think of um, uh, the guy who did New Kid, um, who's the New Kid guy? Jerry Craft. Just on and on and on. There's, there's just a, the Will Eisner YouTube, Will Eisner YouTube site. And this, uh, I think we're gonna house there as well as on Ben's page. Anyway, all right, finally into tonight's event. Um, you know, many, you know, if you're here, you probably know a good deal about Will Eisner's uh, The Spirit and uh, the PS Magazine. Um, and, uh, and of course the graphic novels starting with The Contract with God and to the heart of the storm um, and, and uh, on and on and on, uh, you know, but a large part of Will's uh, career that he loved doing was teaching. So uh, we thought that tonight um, that, uh, you know, unfortunately I don't hear any videos of Will teaching, but I thought that I would get some people who are smart, articulate, accomplished and me and, uh, and get us together and, and really, I'm, you know, it was so great of, of, um, of, of the four panelists and sort of literally, literally or, and or figuratively take a page from Will's book. You know, you know if not teach something that, uh, that Will taught in his, uh, in his own teaching career, then um, something inspired by Will and his work. And, uh, and, and, and you'll see, and, and uh, we have some visual aids as well. So let me introduce the panelists. Um, and again, if you want to find out more about Will Eisner, willeisner.com, certainly, um, has, has his biography. Brian Michael Bendis from uh, the state of Oregon, although hails from Cleveland, so he's uh, from the same home as uh, Superman and Harvey Picar. We have Brian Michael Bendis. Brian Michael Bendis is an award-winning uh, comics creator, Amazon and New York Times bestseller, and one of the most successful writers working in mainstream comics. For the last 20 years, Brian's books have consistently sat on top of the nationwide comic and graphic novel sales charts. Over the years at Marvel Entertainment, Brian completed historic runs on titles, including Spider-Man for 18 years, that's pretty good, Avengers, nine years, Iron Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, and X-Men. Moving over to DC in 2018, Bendis has, has had memorable runs on Man of Steel, Superman, and action comics. Recently, uh, Brian has brought his creator own Jinx World imprint to Dark Horse Comics, where his publications will include his classic Powers with Michael Avon Oman. With Michael Avon Oman. And today you had a big announcement. What you? Um, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, it's not fair that you make me sit on Zoom while you do that. That's like you know. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, we we just signed a deal to do a series of graphic novels for Abrams Comics Art with me and Andre Lima. Uh, it's a beautiful illustrator who uh, has just created an amazing world and it's very exciting and it speaks to this new comics market that we're living in now. Things have altered and it's fascinating. Cool. Congratulations and thank you. Uh, and next is uh, Emil Ferris. Did I pronounce that anywhere near correct? Perfect. Okay. Is a, Emil is a graphic novelist whose first book, My Favorite Thing is Monsters, has been praised by critics since its publication in 2017. Her book, which presents itself uh, as, the, as the line notebook diary of a preteen self-avowed werewolf who questions her sexual identity. Not another one of those books. How many of those books do I have to read? Anyway, uh, <laughs> is set in Chicago in the 1960s. The book is autobiographically infused as Emile, like her protagonist, Karen Reyes, um, or Reyes, or was witness to the highly charged political and social climate of that time. The main character's obsessions with B-movies of the Hammer and Universal varieties and EC horror magazines is evident. Journalists have noted how the book parallels themes of monstrosity and otherness. Not only are EC-inspired horror comics covers recreated in ballpoint pen by Emile's protagonist, but so are many significant paintings that hang in the Art Institute of Chicago. Ferris cites art making as being critically important to her survival of childhood 
disability as well as subsequent physical challenges. My Favorite Things as Monsters has now been published in nine languages and has been honored with numerous awards, among them the Lambda Literary Award, multiple Eisners, the Ignatz, and the Fauve, the Fauve d'Or. Fauve d'Or. It's been a long time since my French glasses. At the Angoulême Festival, France. Emile has exhibited her art extensively in the US and Europe and was most recently honored to teach classes at the Louvre. Cool, welcome. Thank you, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much. Uh, and now, award Emmy and Ringo Award winner, Dean Haspiel, which is how he likes to be addressed. If you meet Dean, please address him as Emmy and Ringo Award uh, winner. Created Billy Dogma, The Red Hook, illustrated for HBO's Bored to Death, was a master artist at the Atlantic Center for the Arts, is a Yaddo fellow, a playwright, and helped pioneer personal web comics via Activate. Dino has written and drawn many comics for Marvel, DC, Image, Archie, IDW, Dark Horse, Heavy Metal, and Line Webtoon, and has collaborated on comics with Harvey Picard, Jonathan Ames, Inverna Lopez, Jonathan Lethem, Stoya, and Stan Lee. And I get 10% of any teaching money Dean ever gets because I'm the one who said to him, he should be teaching. So, you did. I really appreciate that, Danny. Yeah, I think I, you owe I, me, uh, you know, every day you owe me more money, Dean. It's really <laughs> okay. I owe you a dinner. Okay. <laughs> Red Buttons never got a dinner, but you'll get a dinner. <laughs> and Jennifer Hayden is a New Jersey based graphic novelist whose Eisner nominated breast cancer memoir, The Story of My Tits, was translated into Italian and Spanish and is coming soon in French. She's currently working on a graphic novella about France called Le Chat Noir. Everybody's French tonight. As well as an anti-cookbook, her first work in color called Where There's Smoke, There's Dinner. <laughs> Jennifer, should I read it again? Because you have the shortest one. I feel bad. Should I read you, you, you gave You gave me a short, uh, you said 150 words or something, and I obeyed. Oh. You know, uh -oh. that was my big mistake. Yeah, nobody would... ever does that. What, what have we forgotten <laughs> to plug for you? What, uh... I'm a sap, what can I say? But I did leave out my first book, which was called Underwire. Um, and that was a small book that came out as a result of my being on Activate, which is what uh, the hub, uh, comics hub online that Dean pioneered. And Dean actually was my mentor and helped me you know, come along as I was working on the story of my tits and it would never have seen, you know, life without him. So um, anyway, yep. I'm okay. very proud of you, Jennifer, and thank and you. And it was nominated for Nisner. That's right. That's right. All right, so, so now I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna very deftly go to the share screen, screen because this always works without any, oh, look at that, it's actually working. Wow, holy cow. Again, you can see the, Okay, let's, wonderful. All right, well, this is the title, Comics and Sequential. Gerard Will Eisner, Teacher and Mentor. Um, a Will Eisner Week 2022 event. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis, and uh, Daniel Ferris, Dean Haspiel, Jennifer Hayden, and me moderating. That's Will Eisner. Um, not long before he passed away in 2005, he was, you know, well, I guess based on that badge, it's 2004. So this might be how some of his students remember him, although we taught for many years. And then just to, just to, to get in the, some visual plugs, this is an, yet another one of Brian uh, Michael Bendis's current works. It's uh, called Operations. And uh, I, I figured everybody knows you're Spider-Man, so we should see some of the, not, uh, the stuff that doesn't involve uh, webbing. Um, I appreciate it. Covered, my favorite thing is monsters. So um, if you don't own a copy yet, uh, now you know what to look for. Uh, this is the Red Hook webtoon, which Dean will uh, tell us a lot about, including Dean. Dean um, this will be a test of, 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 the, of the tech, because Dean is going to have us go to the internet to look at the uh, webtoon. So that's Dean's. And this is Jennifer's uh, The Story of My Tits. Um, you know, I'm not sure what superhero was in this, but um, you know, we'll, uh, it's pretty darn good anyway. Anyway, this is this is the School of Visual Arts on, 20, on East 23rd Street, where Will Eisner taught. I think he taught even when he moved to Florida. He would fly in uh, maybe weekly to, uh, to teach there, among other things. And again, this is Will around, around that period. Um, but again, the long period when he taught. This is, this is Will's, um, oops, sorry. This is, this is um, I, I think maybe 1979. It's, um, 
This is Will at the School of Visual Arts where they apparently spare no expense on decor. Um, that's Mike Carlin, who you may know as the, as the DC Comics uh, writer and editor. Um, uh, it was at Marvel for quite a while too, but that's Mike in the front and uh, that's Will is the, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the bald guy with the mustache is Will. Some other people on there, third from, fourth from the left uh, is Keith Williams, who some of you may know. Next to him is a guy named uh, uh, Brian Postman. And, um, wow. and, um, and then, the, you know, the, the others did not go on to be quite as comic book famous. Um, it might be a guy named Mark Rogan on the, the upper right, but it might not. Um, this is Mike getting an Eisner Award from Will Eisner, um, after whom the uh, awards were named. Mike is a few years older in this one. Um, and this is, these are some covers of the magazines that Will put together of his students' work. That's called Will Eisner's Gallery of New Comics. Uh, from, this is from 74. Um, not sure what year this is from, but it looks also like around that period. Uh, this is from 1989. So Will, Will was very invested in and loved teaching. And, 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 and at a certain point, he wrote these three textbooks um, that have uh, been revised over the years, including it, posthumously. Some other people, I think Dennis Kitchen and other people have added some notes. But this was sort of the, sort of my, the inspiration I had for, for trying to do this wacky experiment tonight. Um, you know, to sort of uh, see what could be inspired by the spirit of Will as a teacher, as well as by the concrete examples. So, and these are just some of the pages. So the function of perspective, think about uh, word balloons, uh, comics as a form of reading, and, and, and so on. So there, there's a lot of information. Uh, the frame is a narrative device. And, and um, you know, if you ever saw Will speak, or if you saw that any of the documentaries, a portrait of a sequential artist. Here he takes um, the, uh, the, the, the soliloquy in Hamlet and does it as a comic. Uh, I think because maybe it was a Denny O'Neill who said to him, oh, you could never do the soliloquy in Hamlet as a comic. So we'll <laughs> went home and did the soliloquy in Hamlet as a comic. Um, so it covers a, a lot of different topics. And so now we are finally, I'll shut up and we're gonna get to, to our uh, panelists. So Brian Mendes, uh, take it away. What, what is the topic of your lesson? Well, I, I'm, I'm a little all over the place with my lesson, but I will, I will start with this. You just posted that picture of Will from 2004 and it triggered me deeply because I met him at that show. And Diana Schutz, our, our, our mutual friend said, hey, we're going to lunch, come to lunch with us. And I went, I, I, I froze. I froze and I ran away like I wasn't worthy. And then sadly he passed and I, the deep regret that I had that I was given this opportunity and did not take it. And then like a week later, I th I've told you this story, Danny, like a week later, Stan called and said, are you in town? Let's have lunch. And I, I just got on the plane. I just like, <laughs> don't miss like, opportunities. Don't, you gotta take them. So I did learn the lesson but it still it still haunts me to this day that I I I, I missed such a grand opportunity. But um, like you said, Danny, I um, um, uh, I'm I'm inspired by Will uh, on the on the obvious reasons. Uh, but I'm also a Jewish man who grew up in Cleveland uh, at a time uh, pre-internet. I hate to age myself, but I thought looking at the looking at the screens, I think we're all we're, we've all seen a pre-internet life. And knowing that um, looking for the information that Will had compiled in these books uh, was near impossible at the time. I, 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 I was talking, I felt like Indiana Jones. I was like an archeologist looking through back issues of Comic Scene Magazine, the Comics Buyer's Guide, looking for any information I could find about how to make a goddamn comic book. I could, like, it, like, it was so rare that anyone would speak truth and like any, any creator that mentioned a pen or a ruler, I would just buy it. Like I wouldn't even like find out if I it was proper. It was proper for me. Any any information I could get. So when I was finally able to f track down this book, which was not easy to do at the time, it was 
it's hard to describe how, how much it meant. You open it up and here's someone taking all of your questions that have been rolling around in my little head very seriously. Here are all the answers being very seriously answered to you. This meant the world to me. I uh, carried it around like a Bible, like I like, like hugging it sometimes, just like, and, and the lessons that stuck with me the most are ones that I, I keep going back to. And when I keep going back to is his journey as a creator, uh, which is well illustrated in these books. Um, it was brought, actually, I, would, I, was, I was staring at like his journey and not being able to wrap my head around, like, like I was able to articulate what is that I'm, I'm so focused on. And, and here we are in the, in the early stages of his life um, uh, uh, as a creator, full on in the pulp hero mode. And you, uh, there's so many interviews where they go, well, what, he's wearing a mask because he had to like for, for commercial reasons, like they give him a costume. Ah, you don't want to give him a costume. He put on, a, he literally put on a Zorro mask and it's like, now can I tell my stories? And, and, and that's where the, de the detective comes in. But this is genre. This is, this is, you know, him just having fun and exploring and the, the invention of these splash pages, which everyone always says, oh, they set a mood. They do not just set a mood. They tell a story. They tell a story, not only of the character and of the creator, but of comics themselves, of what they can accomplish. That you just open this and just right away, you say to yourself, oh, comics can do anything. Look, right away, like, like I'm always surprised and look, he's always surprising me because it can do anything. But then as he got older um, his work was far less about genre and more about memory and uh, experience and, uh, and, and, and how he grew up. Um, there are substantial changes in the way he creates comics in his journey. And, and, so the most, the most interesting, and it was expressed actually in the movie, Will Eisner Portrait of a Sequential Artist, which I highly recommend. Uh, not only is it a great documentary on Will, but it's also because of Will's place in comics throughout his entire life, it's almost a centuries long look at the history of comics, all right? Um, and, and what somebody brought up in that film was, as part of the Mark Evanier, uh, um, that, that when his work, was um, in his early work is very stark black and white. The blacks are very black, right? Yet the storyline um, is, is lighter and fair, right? But the work itself is very stark. Cut to later in his life, in which this um, uh, uh, drawing is a perfect example, uh, when his work becomes, uh, in his older age, there's a, there's a there's a strident, almost he's emotional, working stuff out, frustration, anger sometimes, literally screaming at God for answers. I, um, and with that came an art style uh, that was less contrasty and much more um, in tones, much more gray area. And I thought the fact that the, as the um, subject matter got more black and white, the art artistry getting more gray toned, almost to counter it. And I, who knows, even on a, on a subconscious level, of which we know some of this stuff happens subconsciously and you look back at it and go, oh, look what I just did there. But I, I'm so fascinated by this deep change in, in what happened. Now, I, um, uh, we were talking yesterday, Danny, and after we were talking, I, I spent a few hours and did a little more research and found, by the way, a great interview by Will that was lost for decades that I will send to you. I don't think oh, you've seen too, it. Yeah. And, and in it, he, he talked about the one thing we were talking about last night, which is someone brought up lighting. Um, and he said, lighting is everything. That lighting is, that, that is our number one tool as comic creators. And um, he said, um, and he was, this is an, he was an older man in this interview. And he said, I, it took me a long time to figure this out, but everybody in the world has a different light language that um, people who grow up in cities see a lot of like heavy lights coming down. And then you and I were talking about how his light sources look very theatrical, right? That it looked like he was using stage language to tell his story because sometimes the, the physicality of the, of the figures 
are so theatrical, right? That the lighting also, it looks like a spotlight literally from the stage. But from his point of view, that was not true. It was city lights. That if you're walking down the city, there's always a light over your head, like a solid single light. But if you live out in the suburbs or in the country, he said, he goes, where's the light? Where's the light? There's light, but where's it coming from? It's not always clear. It's always reflected or a second source. And I thought that alone, just the, the, that how everyone's light comes from a different source, that, that speaks to how everyone's experience comes from a different source. And uh, that lesson is something I've been carrying with me as I go. Um, to have, just to wrap up on, on my little bit, for me to be growing up in Cleveland as a young Jewish man and having someone just owning their Judaism on the page of their comics and are frustrated with their Judaism and questioning it, and all of these things was beyond to me. I, I, like, I, I, I was going to a Jewish school where anytime anyone asked a question, questioning anything, they kind of shut you up. They kind of like, uh, well, you believe in God or not? Like, and like, well, no, I'm asking a question. So to have Will ask the questions, and now we know from some, such a place of deep trauma was an enormous uh, service uh, to me as a young man. Uh, and I think about that lesson, no matter what I'm writing, is that there's somebody out there who is experiencing something like what I'm trying to write into. So write honestly, because the other person out there is going to connect with it or not connect with it based on my ability to do so. So I, boy, I think about it all the time, particularly in these late pieces with Fagan the Jew and the plot, particularly um, as his work got more and more dense and personal as the years went on. Wow, thank you, Brian. Dane, did you have a... I was going to say, like, like hearing Brian talk and knowing and reading a lot of Brian's comics. And by the way, he did a great Moon Knight run as well, which is coming out in like a month. So check out Brian's Moon Knight. Uh, I was uh, thinking it's hard about, to talk about Moon Knight when we're looking at this, but thank you. <laughs> so, um, no, but well, I was thinking about Moon Knight, how, But Moon Knight carries the Jewish theme. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Um, well, I, I was thinking, I, you may disagree, but I feel like Brian writes like how Will Eisner draws you know, in a way, in terms of like pacing, staging. Um, there's a lot of behavior and acting that you write into your characters, you know, and pathos and stuff. And and I also know you started off by drawing comics as well as writing, yeah. right? So. Well, I no, I appreciate that. I think, and this this page is a perfect example, Danny, is that I, I, I came to believe and, and did try to apply it to mainstream comics, sometimes to other people's frustration that every emotion is an action. Like every, every, like every character move is action. Like, and so right here, I see an action sequence. Mm -hmm. Like th this, this page here, I do, I see, I see like, like literally stages of grief, stages of, of emotion and, and that uh, anyone can punch anybody else. This is, this is difficult to produce. And, and trying to apply that to a character like, let's say, Spider-Man, who, who also uh, can, can, can be this emotional based on what's going on in their thing. Yeah, you want to, well, how, how, how truthful can I get with, well, these, with the made-up characters? That's right? how, how deep, yeah. That's what made your work so important. That, that's, that's what you brought to it, that that was kind of always there under the surface, you know, <clears throat> but you really reminded and, and 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 made it into a living thing well the the, the the downside is and not to be cheeky about it is that when people are looking for a book with for punching they're looking for some punching and you're doing you're doing you're doing spider-man's version of this uh you know sometimes you're met with uh, uh you know they, they get frustrated i think i see okay. some punching in your comics um, no, I get there. I get there eventually, but I, I really, you know, like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta earn it. You gotta earn the fight scene. Agreed. Agreed. Amen. So I'm going to move on. I appreciate that, Danny. That was nice. Oh, thank you, Brian. Um, Emil, who um, probably won't tell you, but I will tell you that um, was a little, uh, as every, as everybody in the whole world, including me is, was doing stuff at the last minute because 
and this you know this reminds me of, uh, of uh, something Jules Pfeiffer does when Jules Pfeiffer can't find something he goes I can't find it I'll draw a new one <laughs> so Emil was like I'm gonna be a little late because I'm drawing new stuff and it's like uh, okay <laughs> fine with me so Emil please take it away uh, what, what is your lesson for tonight well I think a lot when I draw so I decided to draw a Karen um, thinking about the what if that I enjoy so much. I mean, there's so many things to pick from, uh, to, to choose from in Eisner's work that you can learn from. I have learned so many things from him. Um, but one of the things that I enjoy is that he, um, he really proposes the what if as, um, as an important thing. And I think it's not just important uh, for the artist, the visual artist, and for the writer. But I think it's also just important, no matter what you are, uh, to allow yourself. And this is something that really uh, disturbs me, um, that I talk to adults, and sometimes I get a little personal, and I say, well, do you still daydream? And people will say, uh, well, yeah, I like to, but I shouldn't. Because, you know what I mean? There's this attitude that we shouldn't, but we should. Because when we daydream, uh, we reach... Uh, empathy. And uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what if. And um, one of the things I liked, I I'm going to talk in this next example, uh, to challenge yourself to explore your own darkness. And nice. this piece uh, of his, um, which we can go to that Kitchen Sink Press uh, published, uh, Life on Another Planet. And uh, I just, I mean, visually, I respond to this immediately because there are these levels in this drawing that are so remarkable. And it's just genius to have done this, to have one city, to have um, this other uh, strata, and then to have the stars beyond. I, I completely love this. And he does this all the time. And um, you know he just does these pages that exactly like Brian says, they communicate so much. It's so rich, it's so exciting. So you see this, uh, this page, and um, you're exploring this kind of darkness and light right away. You know instinctively that this is going to be a story that has dimension beyond what it's telling you. And uh, one of the quotes that a friend of mine said, I guess it was a Margaret Atwood quote, which was, um, science fiction is never about the future. So I think that's kind of a, you, you know right away here that there's more and that it's gonna be more relevant to our life. And I, and I kind of chose this piece right at this moment. Uh, we're sitting under uh, a great deal of stress, I think, as human beings. We see uh, that potentially war is imminent. And I think this moment is a moment that uh, Will Eisner would have understood probably better than most people. Uh, so I just, uh, I chose this piece. Uh, so we could go to the next uh, thing. I think I, I think I go back. Yeah. That that uh, I don't know what the heck I was doing there. You see this again. <laughs> Danny was so good to me because I really was last minute, and he was like, "No, I'll do it. I'll I'll make this for you." And I was, I just like, "We'll do this and this and this." It, it was wrong, but if you go into the next one, we'll get there. And this I wanted to talk about um, personalize to characterize um, when you when you engage in a what if, and, and I'm gonna give an example of a what if for me, and it's really personal. I don't know if I should be telling you this. Um, anyway, I, uh, when I can't sleep, I imagine that I am the uh, ruler of my own country. And I think about, I know this is like, so I'm, I'm a Leo, so that, you know, I'm arrogant. It's, it's, it's impossible, I have to just tell you. So I think about all the good things I would do. And then I think about, well, how would I put down the plot? that is going to arise to, to dethrone me. I mean, I, I go into this place and then I can get to sleep. So, you know, when you do these what ifs, they're so valuable to you because you can enter another person. You can enter another mindset. And here, you know, you have Eisner and he's, he does this literally. I don't know a character that he's ever drawn that I didn't look at and know that he was very capably illustrating an aspect of his own persona. And this is something that I find so remarkable about him because I can almost not say that uh, about everyone. There are a lot of folks who do, who do comics really well, but this man could really invest every single individual. So you see these two characters 
um, you see, I think one of them is Mali and the other one is Argano. I think it's Argano. Anyway, they are really such characters. And here's the pipe. I definitely see this aspect of Will Eisner in, the, in, in, his, in his character who is going to be making terrible decisions. But you, you never feel when you're reading his work that they're simply um, cut out characters. They're not just villains. They're human beings who have a reason to operate the way they do. And, you know, I think that that's something and, you know, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, to you, but I'm fine with that. I think that the most, the most dangerous thing that you can ever do when you're creating a character is to say, well, he's just a madman. You know, nobody's just a madman. People do things for reasons and the, and the way to reach an understanding and create peace is when you decide to understand what that reason is. So, um, you know, I know uh, that has a political application, but when you consider either a human being or you consider a country. One of the important things to think about in regards to that human being or country is how many times have they been violated, invaded, overrun? Because this will inform the opinion of this person about what their circumstances are. It will inform their perspective. And so you see his characters always, um, you sense that they have backstory. Because, because he has so brilliantly invested his characterization with this backstory. It's nonverbal. You don't have to have a, you know, a dialogue with them. You don't have to read their backstory. You look at the, the character here uh, with the pipe in the lower part of this, and you know, there's, um, there's a hunger in him. He's showing you his teeth. He's showing you that he doesn't see well, but not because he doesn't see well, because his eyes don't see well, there's something clouding his vision. You know this before you've even engaged in the rest of the story. You get a sense of that, but he's still a human being. He's still rather beautiful. And so is the other character. He, he's kind of a turtle-like character, but that's all right. So we can go to the next one and uh, or we can talk about, so that's personalized to characterize. And then I think that that always leads you to empathy. Uh, whenever you really invest yourself in understanding your characters and you don't choose to just make them be the villain or make them be the hero, when you understand the depth, I mean, I think all villains are heroes, but of course I do. I love monsters. So you know that already. Um, but I, I do think that all villains are the heroes of their own story. So when you realize that they feel that they're heroic, and, and that creates um, another level of complication for you as a writer, for you as an artist, to not create a cutout, but to really understand who you're dealing with. Um, I was really lucky. I never did anything with years and years of acting training, except to understand that actors are pretty marvelous because they have to really have a living world inside of them before they deliver their five lines. And that living world is what energizes those five lines in such a way that you know that they grew up on a farm and there were cows on it. I mean, it, does, it doesn't come into it, but they have to communicate that on the stage and they do it. And that's, it's very exciting. But writers do the same thing. And I mean, I think anybody here, everybody here knows this. We write so much that's never seen, but it's that stuff it's that stuff that, that accrues substance and creates our world. So, you know, Eisner, and we can, I think there's a, la is there a last page? Did I manage to put oh, yeah, it? There's a, there's a whole bunch of pages. Okay, <laughs> so, so we know that uh, we have here a character who has other objectives. And I love the fact that we don't have him painted. He's the spy but he's not painted as though he doesn't have his own set of, um, his own modus operandi, his own set of uh, ideas, you know, and he's a Soviet spy. So there we are, you know, we're, we're looking at this dichotomy, but it, what we're understanding in the moment is the capitalist in this instance is an individual, he's not just a capitalist, he's an individual with his own reason for doing what he's doing. And this man is an individualist as well. He's saying, maybe we don't want 
to um, be so divided. And maybe we want to share the responsibility of this discovery of, this, of these other beings. I think, of course, this is a, a metaphor for probably nuclear power and nuclear uh, you know, strength in the world, but it's also something else. It's also really, you know, really resonant with the way that we behave. And right now we're at a moment in our country where we don't particularly reach out to people who don't agree with us. I, was, I liked what Brian said about how he had questions and it was just, you either love God or you don't love God. Well, no, no, no. That's not how to arrive at something more beautiful. And I think as children, we always knew that. And so now what I'm kind of saying to people and there are however many people, find yourself a somebody, if you're a Republican, find yourself a Democrat. If you're a Democrat, find yourself a Republican. Find yourself somebody who you really don't agree with, who will irritate the heck out of you and, and engage in a discussion with that person. Because we're at a time and a moment in our country where we are going to lose everything if we don't wake up and realize that's the most important thing we can do. I don't care whether you don't like it. I kind of feel like I'm your mom and I'm like, I'm going to crack your heads together. You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm just as guilty of doing, of doing this, of being very polarized in my thinking. But it, it, the time for that is over. We are going to lose our country if we don't. And I'm just telling you that it's a horrible thing to say and I hope it doesn't happen but I really sense that that's a possibility. And here's Will Eisner basically telling us exactly that because we go to the next scene and we have this incredible darkness. And he does this so beautifully that it, it, just, pains, it just pains me. He, he's asking, he says, you see in the second panel or the second row down, never mind looking for his gun, give me that rock Mally. And the way he has executed this. You don't really know if Mali has done it or not. And I think that's just a really interesting moment. You think, well, maybe he did or maybe he didn't, but whatever happened, this is broken Mali because he has a human soul and he can't call this human being, help me get rid of this. That's just, it's just amazing. And it's not, it's, it's no longer a person. So you, you're seeing everything through Mali in this moment, even though Mali's back is to you, you see everything. And I think it's kind of, there's a poetry to the fact that Mali is touching a tree. And if there isn't anything, and I see this again and again with Will Eisner's work, he, it's very important what people are touching. It's very important what they're near. And he doesn't, he, he does this again and again. And every time he does it, there's an emotional quality to it. You think a tree is just a tree, but a tree isn't just a tree. A tree is the sense of humanity. And there it is. And then the next, the next uh, panel tells you. And so, I mean, I think uh, he has taught me a lot about empathy. And I think we're at a time where we better damn well learn more about empathy. Uh, uh, I, that's what I wanted to bring out. And uh, I wanted to just uh, say, you know, I love what we do. And here he is, and I, I enjoyed this picture. I never had the honor of meeting this man, but I always, I've always felt his presence at the Eisner Awards. And I was always so, so really uh, blessed by his family. And they were always very kind to me. Um, I just think this man must have had an extraordinary amount of kindness to him uh, because, of the work he did. And um, I just, I really hope that we daydream more as artists and, and the big what if that I wanna propose we ask, because this energy, and this might sound very woo, but this energy is uh, very important. And I'm as guilty as anyone of not, of being angry and irritated and not thinking about what my adversary might feel. But the time is uh, now, for us to really consider our quote unquote adversaries and what do they feel, whatever those, however we define the word adversary. Um, and to imagine, to imagine yourself as the person who can reconcile the parts of you and the parts of our world. Imagine what that is, what, what, what shape would that take? Now, in my case, I'm dealing with the fact that, you know, I have a plot being 
foisted upon me by some other king in some other country, right? Because I'm trying to get to sleep and I'm thinking about that. Um, but for you, I'm not sure what it would be, but I, I really just encourage everyone to think about um, the reconciliation that we need. We need a reconciliation and we need to consider, one of the things that um, I wanna put out there is that whenever I am really angry at somebody, I generally don't realize how grateful I am to them. Isn't that crazy? I generally don't think about my gratitude. And sometimes my gratitude is not because they did a nice thing for me. Sometimes my gratitude is because they taught me something by doing a terrible thing to me. And um, there's a philosophical drawback when you look at somebody and you, and you decide to really um, maybe not love them in the typical way where you're giving them chocolates in a, in a heart-shaped box, but love them in the way that you are lucky to be here. We all are. And this is a school for souls. And uh, I think Eisner knew that. And so uh, that's all I want to say to you. And, uh, and I appreciate you listening to me. So wow, thank you. Thank you, Emil. Wow. Jennifer, follow that. <laughs> that should be easy. <laughs> OK. OK, guys. Now Anyone? for something superficial. Um, OK, I'm going to. Leave that to me. <laughs> I will start here. Will Eisner, the king, said, I hold that the story is the most critical component in a comic. Not only is it the intellectual frame on which, no, 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 run it back, Sorry. on which all artwork rests, but it, more than anything else, helps the work endure. Now you can go to the next one. Okay. This is me talking. Cancer survivor has a bad back. Why in hell would I sit here day after day drawing box after box if it weren't that comics is the best way I have found to tell the stories that are sitting on my heart? And you can go to the next one if you want. I uh, had a hard time trying to pack in what I would like to say into um, you know, a 15 minute nugget I need to preface this by saying I have never taught comics and I have never been taught comics ever. And I studied many art forms. Um, I'm a violinist, I danced, I, um, you know, uh, I wrote for many years and I studied all these things to death. And when I arrived at comics, I said, that's it, no more education for me. Now I'm going to follow my gut. And it was the best thing I ever did because I found my voice and I started making the art that I was put on this earth to make. It all started though with a story, which was the story of my breast cancer, which I got when I was 43. So I came to this quite late. I read comics when I was little and then I lost track of them. And now I read graphic novels, but I don't read um, the sorts of comics that are, you know, I don't read uh, the more mainstream sorts of comics. And, uh, and, it, and I was thinking how much Will Eisner would look at me and go, who, who are you? What are you, what are you doing? Because he, he, I'm not sure he would relate to what I do. And yet, when I started in comics, um, the thing I did was read every comic I could get my hands on that I respected and loved. And, uh, and I did it, I gave myself one year of reading. And I said, at the end of that year, you start your book about your breast cancer. It ended up being about much more and it took me eight years to do. But in the beginning, one of the first comics uh, that I looked at were Will Eisner's and, and they struck me as dated. And I had no idea he'd done the spirit. I picked up, um, uh, you know, the, uh, a contract with God and I picked up life in pictures. Um, I looked at my bookshelf, that's all I had. This is a, I'm, I'm going, this is almost makes me cry to look at this stuff because I remember my discovery process with comics. I looked at this and I went, oh my God, the story is literally rising out of the page in words and pictures together at the same time, making me forget that the page is there and making me only care about how the story is being told. And I thought, this is better than writing, better than art better than the movies, better than 
acting. It's all of it at the same time. And there's nothing that can hold as much emotion for me. Of course, the emotion is the same thing as the stories. The thing, um, so, so what I realized was, I'm trying to like keep my notes a little bit to the side here. I, we're, we're good on time, by the way. So, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, I, I have to say that I agree with him that, uh, that storytelling is the main event in comics. And so the stories, um, how do I say this? Uh, if I were to tell someone how to do comics, I would say, decide what the story is that you absolutely must tell. And then find the words and pictures that arrive in your mind as you're thinking of this story, which you may have told your family a thousand times, and you may have told your children, and you may have told all of your friends. When I think of the stories I put into the story of my tits, um, it was all the stories I'd already told. And I told them so many times that I knew exactly how to pace them and exactly where the punchlines were and exactly where the tears would come and 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 I and I and how not to make them too melodramatic, but how not to make them too glib. It's all and since I'm doing autobiographical work, all of these things are things you have to weigh very carefully. Where do you put the screens up so that you don't humiliate anyone else more than you humiliate yourself in the course of trying to tell the truth? Always make yourself look the worst. So um, Eisner, um, this looking at this reminds me just of how, and in black and white, it, there's it's just a beautiful balance of, of black and white. And when I began in this, I was using my rapidograph and all I wanted to do was black and white. And that, that whole book, 352 pages, my book is all in black and white. Um, if you go to the next, slide. This is the story. It's called Sanctuary, his story uh, in Life in the uh, Pictures. Uh, uh, no, it's from Contract with God trilogy. Um, this is the one that made me uh, realize comics was what I was going to end up doing. I, I um, showed it in a drunken passion to my brother one time, just a few years ago, and I was like really sloppy drunk and going, I look, I have to show you what this image is, where I realized how expressive this medium could be. And I pulled out the picture and, and he just was said like, well, it's pretty good. So I look at it now and realize that comics have come a long way, graphic novels have come a long way. And, um, and, and my own um, perception of what can be done in a page and in my case, in a panel, because I'm quite stubborn about keeping it to, to the boxes, I haven't felt the need to break out yet, really. A little in one of the books I'm, I'm working on. And this was an example. So in this story, a man is writing letters um, back and forth with, his ch with a, a sweetheart in uh, Germany. He has fled uh, Hitler already and established himself in the new in the in uh, in the U.S. She is terribly threatened and trying to get him to get her out. And he's remembering how in love they were, how they almost married if it hadn't been for his family. Meanwhile, he's obviously been married for a dog's age in America to this chick who he's not really relating to anymore. And she's cooking, you know. So he's reading a letter from this woman who he's saving. She's on the boat and the letter, here's the delay, you know, it's not email, it's snail mail. He got this letter that she's coming and obviously she's already on the boat and the boat is already on the water. This is an inexorable story that is, the force of the story is just uh, ongoing, it can't be stopped. And you look at the, the lines, the wrinkles in his face, how crappy his clothes are at the end of the workday and you know, all he's thinking about is this woman that he that he's remembering how he loved, and his wife, his poor friggin' wife, is saying, "Jacob, you want some boiled chicken tonight, or what?" <laughs> you know that voice in the background. And it's like, "Shut up!" He's not saying that. But um, do, go to the next one, um, and in the next one, uh, sorry about the quality here. I had to scan it today when I turned the page, rereading the story, and realized it wasn't the first boat. It was the second boat image that knocked my socks off. Here's the boat again, and but you're seeing much more of the water and it's much more of a silhouette. 
I mean, it's a repetition, but you're feeling much more of the force of the ocean and, and she's further and it's further along. And there's there, the conversation is all about what's wrong? What's bothering you? Why aren't you listening to me? I feel, and he's making excuses for this, this old passion that's rising in him and is, a, is about to obliterate maybe his married life and change his life forever. And it becomes, it's in the middle of the panels so that everything is small. Everything is kind of canceled out by the force of that image. And I, I remember that this was the ship that made me say, oh my God, uh, I cannot believe how much I'm feeling for this guy and I'm feeling his story. And um, so when Emil talks about compassion and, um, and Brian talks about how the stories change over time and how he's asking questions. This doesn't end with, we don't know whether they got together or whether he left his wife. This is the final panel. How can I explain a might've been that might yet be? Now, when I'm doing, um, I'm working on a, a small story right now for, I just finished a book and, and that's with my agent and it's probably a dud and you'll never read it. We'll see three years of my life down the drain. But this thing, um, uh, you know, suffering from overconfidence now in quarantine, I'm doing another story. And as I work on it, panel by panel, I, I'll, 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 it's like two hours for this seven centimeter by seven centimeter square, these little squares that I have, right? I draw this on the page and then I fill it. And every minute I'm thinking, ah, oh, I'm, I'm pushing away the things that aren't right the things that aren't the story, that, that aren't the best compression, that aren't the, the, the absolutely germane to what the people are feeling. And it makes it take time. So the, um, if you could show the next panel, I, I, I was arrogant. Um, I was a Leo instead of an Aquarius today. And I included some of my own work because I wanted to show his effect on me a little bit and maybe what I'm talking about, but this is an ad for my work. Okay, this, this has been online, but not in a book. I want to observe here that I also went from black and white to gray. And uh, after the story of my tits and underwire, I found myself um, partly to save my hand, but partly because life didn't strike me as so black and white. Uh, I wanted the stories I was telling to involve a gray tone that would that would join the black and the white a little bit, and um, and also give me something more to play with that wasn't color but was um, interesting to my eyeballs. So in this, this is a just four panels. I'll give you from a, a longer story that was a COVID story, and it was about my husband hurting himself during COVID, and almost a week later, I a deer hit me. I didn't hit hit it. It just committed suicide into the side of my car. Second time this has happened to me. And then it headed into the wilderness to go to the, I, I swear to God, there's like a deer hospital emergency room somewhere in the woods, right? Um, and, they, and they limp away from the car. So I wanted to give, and, and ultimately the story is about how we all lost our innocence in the course of Trump and um, quarantine and the virus. And we and I called this comic Fall of Man, starting with my husband falling down the stairs, but all of us falling from innocence. Um, but also the deer is part of it because you never think you're gonna be hit by anything when you're driving a car. And there's always this moment of, what the hell, man? So let me just read this to you. I'm driving to pick up takeout a few evenings later when it all stops. Quamp, next panel, soft, heavy impact, then incomprehension, suspension, and then the next one, followed by foosh, and the next one. And I'm sitting in my car in a dark field and I am showered with glass. And I searched so hard for a way to draw this one because I, I couldn't be inside the car. I, I wanted you to get the feeling of the glass being such a supernatural experience. I was covered with it. Obviously it was inside the car, not really so much outside the car, but everything stopped. And 
in this in this way that everything stopped when quarantine started and everything stopped for a lot of us when Trump got into office. And um, and I owe this uh, devotion to telling the story in a way that will make the reader absolutely stand in my shoes, but I'm also standing in their shoes. You know, it's just, we're sharing shoes. I really want them to feel what is happening. And, uh, and Eisner was a tremendous teacher for me in that compassion in a thousand ways, but that's, you know, the, the storytelling way that I think is the, the thing I learned that's most important that I use when I'm making comics. The storytelling thing was what I learned the most from him. Thank you, I'm curtsying, that's the end. Oh, thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And, uh... and I just have to say, Jennifer, you are not correct that, uh, Will, I mean, I don't know, I'm not channeling Will Eisner, but I just don't think that uh, his assessment of story of my tits would have been negative. I think it would have been uh, very positive. I mean, I know people who were very devoted to comics in a certain way. One in particular who handed me your book at my local comic shop, and he's a guy, you know, and he was like, here, you, you know, I like this. And I thought, isn't it interesting that he said that and he liked it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, it, and, and of course he did. When I read it, I understood why. But um, yeah, I don't think you gave yourself enough credit there. But that's adorable that you are so humble like that, you know? It's well, but it's also, I'm in this company of people with, you know, um, very long um, uh, list of accomplishments within comics and recognition. And, uh, and I um, appreciate that that's... Uh, I appreciate that I I, um, I feel very workmanlike at this stage of my career, and, um, but I I I give Dean credit because he also looked at my work. He was the very first person in comics to look at the story of my tits, and his response was, "This is good. Why don't you join Activate?" And yeah. which was his comics hub then. And I was so encouraged, and I didn't think anybody who did real comics would, would be interested. And now there's much more. I mean, Dean himself has done stuff that's, he'll tell you, that, that crosses over and in between. And all of us, you know, you do such an amazing job of drawing those, um, the, uh, the horror comics at the fronts of the chapters of, in your book. And they're just amazing. Thank you for that. That's the thing I, I actually really enjoy the heck out of. I mean, it's just, it's almost like eating candy when somebody tells you, you can't gain any weight, you won't have any cavities. It's that part of drawing. It's not drawing the same character 25 times. It's doing something new, some new monster who's doing some bad thing who I can fall in love with. I appreciate you saying that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, I enjoy, I, I wanted to ask you one question about this particular drawing because you were saying you know and this is something I always go through too it's like how do I take this moment the feeling I'm going to have and how do I um, convey it and immediately it was funny when you put this up I immediately saw the broken window but what I loved 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 about this particular drawing is that the way you've portrayed yourself you don't look like a person you almost look like you yourself are a an animal and I like that um that sympathy between yourself and the and the deer or whatever. You know, I thought, is this intentional? Did you do that in, intentionally? No, I work with very, very few lines to define faces, unlike Will Eisner. And so um, I have to very much pick and choose. I wanted, and it's very, it's a very small image. It looks big here. It's seven centimeters by seven centimeters. So I thought, well, what are the two most important features to make it my face? And one of them is my carrot nose. Um, which you can appreciate here on Zoom. And the other is my glasses and my eyeballs just popping out, you know, and I, and, and uh, yeah, and then I had to, and I, and I had to struggle with whether to show um, the, the, uh, the glass still around the edges, because I don't remember that it was, um, but, uh, but it, again, that, that made a smaller amount. It's all these insane decisions we sit here making <laughs> while other people are running the world, right? Anyway. <laughs> By the way, I, wa I wanted to, you know, what, something I didn't mention before. Um, the reason that I had Brian go first is I know he has all sorts of family obligations. And so 
I love you. I want you to stay, but if you got to go and deal with actual real world stuff, good. Okay. You're, you're muted. I can't hear you. I'm enjoying this conversation and I'm good. I hear my wife's got it under control over there. So we're good. Okay. <laughs> Appreciate right. it. But I will, I will say as long as I'm unmuted, Emil, uh, you brought up, uh, uh, I'm so excited you brought up a life from another planet um, in the uh, magical interview I, I, uh, I caught from him from 1980. It was an interview that never was never released when it was made and they just found it uh, uh, recently. He gets all excited about life on another planet. Uh, like I, I, I was, I never actually heard him speak about that graphic novel. Particularly, he got very excited because it was like late seventies and sci-fi was all the rage and Close Encounters. And he was, in the minute someone brought up the graphic novel, because because that's not how the world would react if there was a signal from outer space. That's not how would people and and. And he wrote this whole graphic novel just because he knows that the world would be different than the way it's being presented by Hollywood. And it, and it, and it hit me how like every graphic novel was his like angry answer to a question <laughs> that he gave himself. Fascinating. All right, sorry, please go. No, that's a great observation, thank you. And now we will, letting uh, clean up is, uh, is Dean. Uh, real quick, I also want to say to Jennifer, um, I love how that four panel sequence could also represent an alien invasion or something like, you know, you, you don't show the deer and yet and it ends on like this very weirdly lit, like what is happening next, you know, and I, I also love the fact that you still work within that square restraint. It's small, like you don't do you think about the page? Or is it just four to six panels on a page every time? No, and, and actually, you know, do understand that was four panels out of a larger comic. Right, right, right. Okay, but um, I, I, I started out with four, with boxes, and I told myself, if you ever feel they're not enough, then you will move to page layouts. But I have ADD, and if I got into a page layout, I would spend three years on a single page. So I said, uh -huh. not going to do that. Right, and right. the thing is, um, I do now, I didn't with the story of my test, I do now keep track of, you know, I, if it's four panels on the page, I know which four are on the page. I keep track now. And so they are kind of talking to each other. And there is a sense of a page turn. Right. Um, and very rarely I'll use them all to, together. But I still, well, the, the anti-cookbook I'm doing, I'm doing, there's some food still life. So you, you may be impressed. There's a little bit of wiggle, wiggling there. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, because one of the things that I, I like, listen, first of all, it's great that Brian, Emil and Jennifer, you know, get, get, you know, discuss context, empathy, narrative purpose, you know, with Will Eisner. And, and one of the things that I wanted to bring to the table was how he, um, gave a uh, uh, landscape and object uh, character, you know, not only just the people, which we all just saw great uh, examples of, but just again, landscape and object and how he truly exploited the real estate of the page, you know, and really thought about that. Uh, in this first section, um, I wanted to show like a bunch of, of, you know, examples of how he, how he anthropomorphized font and text. And of course, as we know, in comics, text is, or image is text, you know, and he, he does that all the time. Uh, and he's one of the, the, the great masters of that. Um, so here's an example of, you know, uh, there's a whole story in, the, in this one image. There's a, there's a dead man in a puddle. There's a sh uh, old ship in the back. And, the, and then we have, you know, this detective wearing a Zorro mask, uh, the spirit, uh, arriving upon the scene, and yet we also have the title of this character, who you know the spirit's all laid out in brick, and then the I think might even be like a spider web or water or something. I can't really tell. And I love the way he he introduced that uh, that idea to comics. And and Danny, if you want to go through some of these slides, right. here's another great example. Uh, again, the way he would often start a story is obviously with the title, but he. You know, at some point, must have gotten bored of just having the old spirit section, you know, logo up there, and would also incorporate the title into uh, uh, the image. And uh, here we have, and it took me a second to realize what I was looking at. It looks like a torn out piece of newspaper, 
but it does say the spirit while uh, the spirit is actually walking and gets hit in the face with like a, a mayoral pamphlet. Uh, again, just utilizing the space in very interesting ways and, and, and while telling a certain kind of narrative. Here we have what actually is a prison cell <laughs> with a, a, a vent of some sort uh, that again, it says the spirit, it says the title of, of the character and it says the title of the story in this swirling kind of, uh, what I don't know, there's a drain or something and it says escape. Yeah, <clears throat> a tunnel. A tunnel, whatever, you know, where, where you're imagining that the person that has to stay in that room is going to use this space to escape, uh, like a foreshadowing. It's a jail cell. It's a jail cell. It's a jail yeah. cell, that's right. That's right. Um, and the next one... The name of the guy I put you in the cell was, you know, spelled out in the bar, so... <laughs> And, and here we have like the spirit jumping through a window, but this is the splash page. This is the, the cover and you still get the spirit, you know, title in here. But the, and the way, the, you know, the boldness of the negative space alone is pretty amazing. Usually people would feel like they had to, to fill that space in, but the negative space actually serves this image to make it feel like almost three dimensional. This is, uh, so uh, I think, Brian showed this one earlier. This one blows me away. And, and I think also Brian mentioned how there is a narrative even on the title. Like there's some, you know, the, in fact, it's a drain. If you look outside, there's a marquee for a theater that says the, or a sign, maybe it's a sign. Then we come into this like underground area where we have like these figures that are, you know, flopped over parts of this structure that spells the spirit. This is a beautiful one where, again, uh, Eisner was not shy to draw landscape and, and place. Uh, uh, again, it, it was a character of the story. And here we have like this floating discarded paper that spells out the spirit as well as the title of the story. And, and this is, this always blows me away when I see this because it's truly innovative and inspired. Uh, you know, you have the, the main character walking toward his own name. But again, there is some narrative hair, like either people sleeping or beat up. And there might even be someone running away at the very end by the letter T. I can't figure it out, but it almost feels like a chase sequence. Right. It, it's, so, I, think it's, I think it's inspired by, because um, I've seen, I, I, you know, there are stills from the cabinet of Dr. Caligari that kind of, Oh, wow. Yeah, that kind of German expressionistic type of feeling, yeah, right? That's amazing. And the next page, we're going to get a little bit into uh, what I also love about uh, Will Eisner is his theater and the way he stages. Uh, here, you know, you have brick walls and uh, these aren't necessarily windows. These are panels of, of a narrative, but they look like windows in a building. And it does you know, tell part of a story. And there was a lot of his comics. I was really fond of uh, Will Eisner's New York, the big city book, which had a lot of mute stories. Uh, again, where image is text, but you get, you get a sense of feeling and, and, and narrative purpose through, through these mute uh, theatrical comics that he drew. Here's a subway scene uh, where uh, it appears the person's drunk and kind of just, I don't know, whistling to himself or just cheering. And then he notices a man sitting uh, on the bench uh, reading a newspaper and uh, basically, I think, tries to befriend him or begs for money and, and the guy just ignores him. And finally, the guy just flops to sleep. Uh, again, just the beauty of this. You know, you don't need words. You, you can fill them in yourself. I love this page because the first three panels is like your traditional comic. And you hear you have a woman watering like a little garden and you slowly see it grow and, and get taller than her. And then you pull back. And at first I didn't even see her in the garden in the bottom middle of the page because all I saw was this city and the bridge and, and the housing. But then it's, it's like she is surrounded by another thing that's growing, this big city that's happening. Again, just more examples of like the theater of Eisner and how, you know, when, if you look closely to each panel, the thing that's weird about 
mute comics is that you, they can go by really quickly. And in fact, you have to take more time to appreciate them and to actually study each panel. And it kind of uh, competes with your attention span because you just want to move on and move forward and turn the page. But with these kinds of comics, you literally have to sit with them for a minute and then kind of, uh, kind of like when reading a book, when you read prose, you become the co-author. You become mm -hmm. the co-author of these kinds of comics because of what you uh, add to it so that you can better understand and take something away from it. Yeah, Dean, uh, someone brought it up in the chat and I was going to yell it out too. The other oh. fascinating thing about the theatricality behind his work here is that his father worked in theater. Oh. Right? He was a scene painter. So there's like theater in his blood. So there's young Will Eisner is talked following his father around and um, experiencing the world of theater, which we, we know was right. powerful and exciting. Um, and at the same time, his mother uh, not being thrilled about that Will was following in his father's footsteps because his father wasn't really paying the bills in America with this stuff like he was uh, in the old country. So I find it fascinating. It's something Danny has brought to my life twice because my whole, whole life I was uh, so fascinated by some of Stan Lee's choices that he made. And then it was in Danny's book I plug in your book, Dan. Thank you. That uh, um, that you yeah, you find out that that uh, Stan was forced to go to work in publishing at age sixteen for his uncle. So he's at sixteen. He's working in New York at a shit publishing house. Hey, does it sound like Peter Parker? <laughs> Look how personal this shit gets. That's it, the most personal thing Stan ever put in those books. Is yep. the thing everyone connects to the most. And they don't even know how personal it is. That's right. So. That, and, but back and, to Will, I, I found the connection between how they grew up in New York and how it influenced the work uh, enormously. Well, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you think about if you think about the television that he would have been watching early on, like The Honeymooners, let's say, and I Love Lucy and those shows were basically staged, you know, like they, they felt like they were on a stage. A lot of that old television yeah. and, you know, and what he was doing here, it's like, look at this page, for instance. And what he's been doing is he's removing the, the panel borders. You know, uh, the art uh, creates its own borders, you know, and yet you can still follow it uh, because of the way he uses negative space and black and white and gray. And, and it still feels like theater too. This is like this incredible hybrid that he put together. Right, it feels like theater, but, but he's brought the camera in the outside. I mean, you know, yeah, because that was, even when I interviewed Will, that was sort of something he and I, discussed in that one interview I did with him um, that the difference between the spirit and the graphic novels was that he you know that that he wasn't trying to shoot through a wine glass or from a rooftop but but I mean oh, but this is a this is still a cinematic thing where you cut from an exterior to to uh, to, the, to the interior yep yep and then the next page right again look at the way he uses a tunnel or, or a rail, you know, a subway to break up the panels. Uh, I mean, I'm, we're not spending too much time to, to actually experience the narrative here. It just design alone is just incredible to, to be inspired by and, and to take those kinds of chances and those risks. I mean, look at that, come on. He cuts a, a house in half and turns all the rooms into a, a narrative, like a story. That's 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 amazing, and yet it, it weirdly it's almost too obvious. But look how great that is, you know. Like of course, the house is like a comic book, you know. And imagine and this, and this is from the spirit. Imagine opening your Sunday newspaper, if you folks out there remember newspapers, you know. Imagine uh, right. Imagine that in your in your Sunday newspaper. That's kind of you know. <laughs> I, I mean, they had gold when they when whoever was was carrying uh, Will Eisner in their papers, like they were the winners. <laughs> And we're going back to a title sequence just because now we're going to get into my phase. I'm going to do what Jennifer does because Danny, you did ask, I think, to have us show some of our art and how we're. Yes, I did. Right. This is uh, no, Dean. This is completely inappropriate. You completely misunderstood <laughs> my request. I'm, so I'm we're going to go. Plug. I'm, I'm, I've never been so insulted. I'm pulling the plug now. That's that. That's oh, it. Oh man. <laughs> um, well, let, let's just try to finish this. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll bite my tongue and, and we can. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we have the spirit uh, and, and how, again, he uses 
uh, it's kind of like anthropomorphizing a font. Uh, and then we, we're gonna switch into how he influenced me a little bit. So in the next slide, when I did uh, work with the Harvey Pekar and I brought him to DC Comics to tell his origin story and he called it the quitter, I had a really tough time figuring out, well, how the hell, what's the image for the cover? I had no idea what it could possibly be. And then I was looking at Will Eisner comics and went, oh, I know what to do. I know what to do. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have him walking away, uh, Harvey Pekar, and uh, the quit, is, and what he's walking away is what he's quit. And it's like this, this kind of almost like this city or this, this anomaly or whatever it is. You have to go read the comic to find out, as it were. But I realized to keep it really graphic and simple, and and noir, you know, because I love noir. Oh, by the way, you have a quote from Jonathan Lethem, as, as one has, as one. That's does. right. <laughs> <laughs> I think he called it. Uh, he said it's Harvey Picard's confessional masterpiece, and then I think he meant to add me in there somewhere too. But. <laughs> The art is so seamless. That's right. Pulls together so seamlessly. Deep. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and in my own work, this is this is another collaboration with Harvey Picar for an American Splendor comic that Vertigo published. Um, just you know, often what you're trying to do with an artist to keep yourself interested is to like change the camera angle, you know, for narrative purpose if you can, just to keep it. But there's something about keeping the figure in one stationary space to show behavior and. You know, you can cut away to a close-up uh, for for dramatic effect, you know, or to to get inside the mind or the eyes of a character. But all those those four panels there, where it's basically just Harvey is confronting this toilet that he has to plunge, and and what was also great about working with Harvey is that this would be a dilemma, you know, like the the dilemma of the story, <laughs> you know. Dean, I appreciate, appreciate that you gave him the fancy modern kind of plunger too, you know. That, uh... <laughs> There's no way Harvey Pekar had a modern plunger. No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> That's right. That's and then the, the next section comes in. <laughs> <laughs> and this is going to, now I'm going to show some of my artwork. And again, yeah. thinking about, oh, that was my artwork too, but this is a character called the Fox that Archie Comics uh, has that I've done for Archie. And, you know, just using the space and, and, and of course this has been colored and lettered, but I just wanted to show you the black and white art and how I'm seeing, uh, you know, when, when you can knock around panels and yes, this is an action sequence, but also you, you don't really need the words and, and, and the color. I mean, to, to kind of get a sense of what's going on here. If you want to go to the next page, it's the whole sequence. And, okay, you know, I love that so much. I mean, yeah. <laughs> thank you. It's just really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, just having fun with like, you know, things that move and yet look at the city. We got a subway, we got, I'm using, uh, you know, buildings and, and lights and, and, and all that stuff. And, and again, inspires a lot by Will Eisner, you know? Um, here, he, he takes the tentacles of this uh, Madam Satan and ties them into a knot to kind of trap her uh, underneath this bridge. And then you go to the next page, so the subway that we saw before coming just explodes into her and her teeth and eyes go flying in every part and then it drenches him with it. And on the next page, he walks away, you know, exhausted by this fight and falls over, but her eyes are still alive and they bounce away <laughs> to come back uh, again another day. But again, it's very like, like that first panel that like all these insets are covering into is like, that's so Eisner to me, you know, like, like, I don't know, I, I feel like he really uh, played with space in such a beautiful way. And again, exploiting the real estate of the page, you know? Yeah, oh, nice. Just another example right. of, of, you know, perspective. And then I think we're gonna get into, oh, a little bit more, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, like, I wanna explain, use this page real quick to show space. Um, this, is, this was an autobiography comic I did where I'm riding my bike uh, because of a situation that happened. But as I'm riding my bike, uh, and you'd have to read the story for more context, uh, there's a drunk that comes out of a bar and kind of wobbles out and falls flat on his face. And it kind of showed like, like movement. There's actual movements, almost animation happening. And I think Eisner did that a lot in his work as well, with this sense of animation. And then Krikstein took it to another place also. That's right, the subway scene. 
Um, I think that leg, that leg that, uh, the leg that the has bubbles. almost shaped uh, right behind his head, the way that yep. you and the, the, when you collapse the plane, that line just moves through from the leg yeah. to the arm. That's I right. really, really, I got to tell you, I see Eisner doing that too. And I just love that. that and, and the way that the leg is not humanly possible and yet is just exactly right because it Thank conveys you. the combobulation of That's being right. drunk. And I like that. I really like that decision. Yeah. I need to do that more. I, I, I we stiffen up often as artists and, and try to get something right. But you, what you're trying to really do is convey feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, again, just more city stuff, just more autobio. Danny, we can get through a couple of these images, just playing again with space, buildings, character, narrative, object. That's <laughs> great. Oh. You know, and this is all autobiographical comics. There's no superhero stuff here. And I love superheroes. Uh, and how the eyeglasses here create a sense of time, you know? And so the, so the Red Hook is a character I've been working on the last five years. And I just wrapped up uh, what's called the New Brooklyn Saga at Webtoon, which is on your phone for free or online, wherever. Uh, and what Danny wanted me to do was kind of bring this to the present time, which is, Web comics. Listen, I love print comics. Because even though he died, you know, 15 or more, what, uh, somebody do the math. He died in 20, 2005. So more than 15 years ago, 17 years ago. Wow. Bill was still talking about, you know, I mean, digital comics. Uh, that's sort of how I, I met Will, um, really working with uh, Byron Price on some early digital comics. But Will was mm -hmm. excited about that that medium e even then. So I think he would have been excited about, about this. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, real quick story. Someone mentioned Diana Schutz. So Diana Schutz brought Will Eisner to SPX a long time ago. Thanks, Brian. And um, she was introducing him to specific artists. And I got to be a lucky, one of the lucky ch chosen few where I met him. I showed him a comic I was working on. He flipped to the pages. He looked at me. He pumped his fist and said, kid, you're the wave of the future, right? And I was just like, what? And I was blown away. I think I've told the story before, Danny. And then I just was like sitting with that moment. And about 10 minutes later, at the other end of the room, I heard Will go, kid, you're the wave of the future. <laughs> and I love that because he was just encouraging the youth, the, the new kids on the block to keep going and make, make your comics. And, and so in a weird way, I feel like beholden a little bit to him by having gone uh, and entered the web comics realm, you know? Well, Jack Kirby told me, he said, I can tell you're a real firecracker. A real firecracker. <laughs> <laughs> so real quick, just to show, understand what we're looking at here. These are um, me taking pages uh, that I drew of the red hook, which I draw traditionally like for print, but I had to cut them up for a vertical scroll. And then I'll show you what those pages look like. But I think we're going to attempt to go online for a minute, yes, right, Danny? That's where that's where we have the internet interlude. <laughs> and go so. to the first chapter of the Red Hook. We're not going to read it. I just want to slowly scroll through it All right. to show you what it looks like online. I, and I think we have to go. Out, ben, what I have to go out of the share and then go to the uh, internet. Um, well, let's. Yeah, I think no. Uh, just close the um, PowerPoint, maybe. I don't think I can while oh. it's sharing. But let's see. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, but I got yeah, here we I go. Just open a now I can go back to, right. now can I go back to the share screen? Let's see. Yeah, you shared the different screen. There we go. Share. Yeah, yeah that all right. So wow. Danny, just slowly scroll through this. And so like you rehearsed it. So just like this, you don't need to read it, just go through it. And basically the thing about working at Webtoon or certain um websites. Uh, that you have a certain width. It's about an 800 pixel wide width that you're working with, but it can go as tall as you need the chapter to be or the comic to be. So the way it was explained to me, it's like a roll of toilet paper, you know, that has a fixed width, but you keep pulling on it and, you know, and then watch this sequence right here. So this is one page that slowly turns into another page, which I'll show you afterwards, but it looks like one seamless thing. And then there's like, hellfire and smoke and it's a little pebble that comes flying out and then it keeps going and we follow that pebble and it hits our hero in the head um <laughs> and then we get to the rest of the narrative 
And that's me trying to play with the format. Like, oh, well, we have to pull down. And also what's interesting about the vertical scroll is that a lot of the reveals happen at the bottom of a page. You know, in comics, it's left to right and you have to turn the page uh, and, you know, go from right to left. And often you'll get like a reveal or something, or you try to keep a cliffhanger moment to the right side. This is all format stuff. Here on the, on the vertical scroll, it's all toward the bottom of, uh, of the page. So you can get out of that, Danny, and then go into, or just go to the end of this real quick. Okay, I'm almost at the end of this, so let's get to the... Uh... Almost done, here we go. We get a little close up, okay. And then I'll show you, All right. so, you know, uh, I know, I, I don't know how many of y'all lay out. I, Jennifer, I don't think you lay out anything, right? You just go right to your constrained square, right? So the composition happens within the square. So when Danny goes back to my comics, um, not only did I have to think about the eventual print version of the comic, but I also had to figure out, well, how is this going to look cut up? So like a splash page looks like a panel online. And, oh, you're gonna have to speed through all those, right? <laughs> okay. And a warning to the, uh, anybody's sense. Here we go, we're almost there. Right. And so I had to think how to make the comic work twice in two different formats. So after now seeing the way it looks online, you'll see the way it looks here. Uh, and then Dan, if you go to the next page, this is a splash page, that's a splash page. And then the next page, the top half of it. So that looked like so, almost like an animated seamless kind of panel online. But here it turns uh, that little sequence into basically two and a half pages. How hard uh, again, just to, to think about. How hard was that to plan? That seems very- it's, it's a little hard to think about and I had to do that a lot. And also what's interesting about, and this is a little insider baseball, but you kind of have to forfeit the landscape panel. You can't really do insets. Um, and, and that's why this seems a little more constrained to what I, you know, from those Fox pages to these Red Hook pages. You can see I had a little more free form and exploited the real estate a little bit more. Uh, it was a little more fun to draw. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's what I have to say about Will Eisner. I, I, I love how, he, he made uh, characters out of landscape and object. And, and I love the theater of, of, of Eisner in a lot of ways. Thank you, Dean. That was wonderful. Thanks. So Ben, do we have time for any questions or discussion? How are we doing? Sure, you can just put your name in the chat if you uh, okay. um, have a question. Um, I wonder, is anyone have... here who had Eisner at SVA in the audience? Just curious what he was like as a I know a few people who had his classes, but uh, then I, I don't think they're here. Dean, I, I I wanted to, you know, we talk about the theatricalness and the cinematography, really, but but you know, he was such a master cartoonist. That, that's where the gesture drawing, and he's he's like of his peers of the time, like the just the best renderer of figure work. And you look like, and you see, there's a language there that actually was reminiscent of a lot of like Andy Cap. Like there's like there's like a little bit of connection there to that yeah. language, you yeah, know, absolutely. and he, he was leaps ahead of it, but you could see that there's the same DNA. Yep. Like how you can see like films are made of a certain time, even though one's like a masterpiece and one's, you know, sure, silly. Sure. But I, 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 I just, I, I think because of this, the, the beautiful design and, and masterful writing that sometimes the cartoon, the cartooning itself uh, uh, gets taken uh, for granted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, here's another master people talk about is Alex Toth and how the way he you the way he composed pictures and the black and white of his art and it's and often he would reduce it down because comics as an art form is a reduction. It's a shorthand. Yeah. And often people take that for granted, like what you need to do to arrive at your shorthand, right? And even if you're rendering a certain amount, you know, like like Eisner did or Ditko, Kirby, you know, told everyone did it so differently, but like to try and find that shorthand, and that's something that you you spend a lifetime trying to figure out, you know. Um, so yeah, no, I, I it is often taken for granted, and and almost if you're not paying attention, 
it, you start to think, well, I can do that. And that's a good thing. You want people to feel, you know, yeah. unintimidated, you know, but then when you actually study, you go, I could never do that. <laughs> what is going on here? You know? Yeah. A part of the magic of our, of our job, like any entertainment job is to make it look easy and fun. So it's fun for the person experiencing it, but it's, it's not, it's not. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's also great. to make it relatable. Magic. It's to make yeah. it relatable too. And, and in the course of making it relatable, then it then you end up making it look simple. Right, right. Yep. There's a question or a comment from Julian Davis. You can unmute yourself maybe if you'd like to. Maybe just we can just, are you there, Julian? Julian uh, Davis? Yeah. Julian Davis. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hi. hi. Did you want to make that comment in person or? Uh, which one? Oh, the one about Eisner visiting your film class. Oh. Well, that? yeah, we were uh, well, we were le le learning about doing storyboards, you know, for a film. Um. Yeah, so he he had just come in and um, yeah, just did. Uh, I don't really remember everything, but just a discussion on you know how how to use the illustration to like you know exhibit what you you'd want to see in the camera frame and all yeah. that. So it's it ends up. Look, you know, especially well when you have a storyboard artist who's really good. I mean, it does end up looking like a comic book, pretty much. Yeah, yeah it's so yeah. different. One is sort of a, a work in progress thing to make a movie, and one is a finished work. Right, it's a big difference. Yeah. But anyway, thanks mm -hmm. for that, ma'am. And um, Andrew Field has a question, I think, or a comment. Yeah. Um, oh wait. I loved this presentation a lot, and uh, it was really a thrill to hear people talking. I grew up reading Spider-Man, and it was kind of a thrill to hear everyone talking. And Mr. Dean, I love um, that PCAR comic, so it was cool to hear you talk about it. Thank you, um, thank you. I guess I'm new to kind of graphic novels and cartoons. I kind of do that work myself. Um, but I, I watched an interview with Stan Lee and Eisner, and it was so fascinating because it was like, like I like learning about the history of it. It kind of gives me a sense of the roots of it kind of. And it was like two Titans kind of coming together, but it was weird because Stan Lee was like sort of the lifeblood of my childhood. Like it was like the Spider-Man, like I was like, you know, a huge comic book guy. But then Eisner was like a, a, an entirely different tradition in a way, but they both did sequential art and they were both like sort of interesting Jewish men. And I'm sure their work was in some degree a response to the Shoah or the Holocaust in some sense. Um, so I wondered like how, how would people, how would you, how would you characterize those two different traditions, like sort of comic books and like, sequential because eisner also did the spirit which i haven't read yet i'd like to read it wow. but so it's like that was kind of a comic book in a sense wasn't it but it was kind of more literary it's all, it's all, i hate to break it to you but it's all comics i think it's all if it's sequential art it's unless it's a gag cartoon you know where it's a one panel thing it's all comics you know and and the way i would i, I don't think i've seen that stanley will eisner interview or talk but you know just like just like filmmakers you have different people who approach that lens, you know, and try to make something and, and you know, and, and whether it's genre, memoir, serious, funny, superhero, whatever, it's all still using the same tools. Yeah, I, I actually posted this conversation you're talking about in my newsletter yesterday as an in, invite to this, uh, in, invite to this thing. So if you got it, go check it out. It's, an, it's a really interesting interview because Stan's kind of annoying Will for some of it. Uh, which not not in a not, not they don't they don't they don't dislike each other, but their energy is very different. And just are two 
New York Jewish men uh, and 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 they grew up on different sides of the town or something. And um, and it's it's from the uh, comic book great series that uh, uh, Stan did. So it's literally like he interviewed Todd McFarlane when he was 12 and Rob Liefeld when he was nine and then Will at the height of his powers. So it's like the, 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 the difference in conversation. So Stan's trying to keep it light and Will is not there and, and will is going and, and pulls stan into a a more profound conversation of will, of which stan was completely capable of doing but it was fun to watch will kind of come over here stan come come let's have an adult conversation it was kind of cool. they have certainly it. a different worldview right i mean there was a period there was one point when stan had become was becoming publisher of marvel and he uh, had a meeting with will to offer Eisner to be the editor in chief of Marvel, and Eisner had absolutely no interest in doing a in superheroes, b in corporate owned comics, unless he was the corporation that owned it. You know, I mean, he, you know, they they had very different worldviews, but they both um, were managerial. You know, they 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 both escaped to a large degree the fate of people like Siegel and Schuster or or. Or, or other other people who are abused uh, in that particular way by the industry, but their I think their worldviews and their aims were, were different. You know, although, although they both at different times talked of comics as art. You know, I mean that was certainly fairly rare among people of that background and in that business. Yeah, but but I will say just if you have a chance, there's a book that Dark Horse produced based on uh, called Shop Talk. Mm -hmm. And it's Will mm -hmm. Eisner yeah. interviewing uh, every, all of his peers, Jack Kirby. It's one of the best conversations I've ever heard. The two of them, it does not uh, disappoint. But uh, on top of everything else, Will might have invented the podcast because that's what these are when you listen to them. <laughs> well, you can hear those tapes there if you buy the, um, I mean, maybe somebody's pirated them, but if you buy the DVD of, um, of, of Portrait of a Sequential Artist, one of the bonus things is, is those the tapes of those interviews. It's all on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't pirate yeah. them. Buy the tape. Buy the buy the buy the, uh, buy the DVD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that, if you that, enjoyed that conversation between Stan and Will, this book is that times ten. Yeah, Dan Theodore had a comment and a um, something to sort of a private tutorial. It sounds like with. Uh, well, I, I'm not an artist. I'm simply a fan. Uh, and I'm appreciator of so much of the creativity. And I am just blown away by just even talking to all of you right now. Uh, but when I was in 2004, I was in Florida, helping my father who had, had a heart attack. And he had a doctor's appointment in Tamarack. And Tamarack just rang in my ears because I remember seeing the address of Will Eisner Studio <laughs> in Tamarack. It just went, oh. And so I dropped my father off at his appointment and I went to Will Eisner Studios in Tamarack. And it was a um, medical arts office building. And he had poor, poor house press was one of the doors there. And I knocked, I came in. And this is a secretary, and I explained I'm just a big fan of, of Mr. Eisner and I would of Will Eisner's work, and it would just be amazing if I could meet him. She went away and she came back. She said, Mr. Eisner will see you now. <laughs> and he brought I brought him, went into a studio. He said his his uh, drafting table is there, his awards around him. He had just received the um first um bound copy of the plot that he was looking wow. at and he sat and he talked with me for about half an hour about story versus art um he didn't have some nice thing he had some not so nice things to say about some artists who don't know how to tell the story um he did have very nice things to say about craig thompson and the book blankets which was fairly new at the time mm -hmm. um Yes. We talked about uh, the spirit. We talked about a bunch of things. And then he said he went and got a copy of S Spirit Archives, Volume 4. He said, I don't want you to leave empty handed. And I knew what that meant. That meant, but I want you to leave. <laughs> I can take a hint. And uh, he, he, but it was possibly the first time I ever had a deep conversation 
with someone who I admired so much. And uh, I later found out that, um, interestingly enough, his nephew is in the same profession I am, which is he's an actuary, which all of you can go to sleep now. <laughs> and uh, he worked in the same building I worked in, in New York City. And uh, he said his uncle always was in a rush to get back to work, that, you know, he had only so much time for family, and then it was back to work. And he was working, you know, that was three or four weeks before he passed away. Hmm. So I consider that a great blessing that I did get to meet him. And uh, thank you for sharing that story. Ah, thanks for sharing it. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, it's a comment from Wayne Beamer. Yeah. Hi, Ben. Dean? Hi. Hey, hey, Dean. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Wayne. Yeah. Andrew, I read The Spirit when I was eight years old. 60 years ago when it was reprinted in the Harvey reprints for 25 cents. I can't wait. I, I, I would love to be an adult and never have read The Spirit to see what I, how I would appreciate it now. Um, I have to tell you, my other recollection is, I'm 66 now, as an eight-year-old, I living in South Texas, right? Never met a Jewish person in my life until I think till I was 14 years old, but I didn't realize it, that I'd already known Will Eisner, Jack Kirby, all those guys. I had been inundated by all those people, you know, and educated by them. Um, I, the only question I had, and this was, I, this was an offshoot of something that Dean had talked about, about the technology, about how he put his pages together for, uh, for, for the web and for print. I wonder how Will would have taken to this new technology. Would he have embraced it? Would he have rebelled against it? Would he have, would, would, I, I, I kind of think he would have embraced it because I think he, because I think that's just the kind of person he is. But I, you know, I, I, I see the love, I, as somebody who loves print and is getting used to digital, I, you know, it, I like the way it works and you're right, Dean, as far as the way you read, it's really different. You know, the way you read it and you, you know, I'm used to going left to right. And I'm also used to, and it, one of the things that, I, I, I don't know if you guys brought this up earlier in the conversation, that the splits between, one of the things I learned was the splits between the panels, right? The open space between the panels tells you something, right? It get, It's forward motion. So in a web format, how do you get that motion? Is it more like, is it more like moving pictures? Do you, I, 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 am I talking, am, am, am I making- No, you're, you're talking about format a, a lot of ways and 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 I, I don't want to get into the minutia here in this Eisner conversation about that, but sure. the, the bigger take question, I think, and you and I can talk about that later, Wayne, but yeah. I think the bigger thing is how would Eisner uh, adapt or hell reinvent web comics? I mean, exactly. Right? Yeah, and he can do something. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe someone else who's, who well, knows I, 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 better. I, you know, just based on, on his books and talking to him, Will was very interested in digital. And I was saying the way that I met Will was working for a guy named Byron Price, who was very early yeah. into the internet. Mm -hmm. And Byron, this was in like the mid 90s. Byron and Will had a project that was called the Spirit Screensaver. And it consisted of snippets okay. of, uh, of, of art from the spirit, as well as like 15 second short interviews with Will. And, and, and I think just, you know, based on interviews you read uh, with uh, say Scott McCloud. Yeah, I, th I, th I, think, I, th I think Will just, you know, just in terms of being, you know, to me, it seemed that Will uh, and and Stan and a couple of other guys, Kirby, a lot of comic professionals, when they get to be older, lose their curiosity and their enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And and I mean that was that was why we were all shocked when Will passed away. That you know that you know he was eighty seven, which you know was a respectable number, but he was so alive and so curious. So yeah, I, I think he would have. Yeah, just, just. I, I don't. I don't think there's anything in his work that says anything different. He was okay. from from those spirit splash pages all the way to the plot. He was looking for the next thing. He was pushing the boundaries. 
He was looking for ways to experiment and explore and explode. So I, I don't see how digital wouldn't be part of that. I, I, the the is, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. No, I was going to say that we we know like you see, uh, Dan is hinting at. There's two kinds of creators uh, in any field where they get to a, a, a place in their careers and they go and they get very like that's not how you do it. You only do it this way. The way right. I learned when I was a kid. That's the only way. And then there's other people who are like, "Where's the end of this? There's no end to the journey. It just goes and goes and goes. Ah. Where can I go next?" So um, and it, it it sometimes it's age and sometimes it's experience and sometimes it's just how you're wired. But it looked like Will was the other person looking for the journey, always mm -hmm. looking for questions to answer. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question from Dave Berger, David Berger. Are you there, David? Hi. Oops. Did Will have any politics? I always ask stupid questions like this. Where do you stand politically? It's kind of hard to tell. Can you hear me then? Yeah, we got that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I remember in, during the Vietnam War, people were pretty upset that he was working for the Department of Defense. But, uh, you know, I don't know if he saw what his how he rationalized that or it was just another job. Or well, I think, I think it, what he said about it was that he he was teaching he was helping people to not have their equipment blow up and not right. uh, that was that was his line about it um you know i i don't know did he i i don't know if he took very strong political stands except you know certainly anti-fascist anti-authoritarian i mean there was he, he was he was a product of that world war Two generation um, and, right. and kind of of the of the Bronx of the 1930s, but I, I mean I'm not trying I'm not trying to be uh, coy. But does any does anybody are there issues? You know, I mean one thing he did do. Look, he when in the times that he, you know, I think he was aware that Ebony was kind of a uh, a hot button for some people and. I think any time he drew that character in the 60s or any black characters, he, I think he went out of his way to not have them be a caricature like that. You know, whatever, whatever sort of creative pride he might have felt or that, or that Ebony was a, a character of his time, I think he progressed, uh, you know, to a, to a large uh, extent in, in, the, in his later work. I don't know, does anybody else have any thoughts? It, it's, um, Lapsy you know, Avenue was pretty, ne you know, awfully fatalistic and negative. I mean, well, I don't know if that's political stance. Is <laughs> yeah, I mean, that tells you something. There's not a whole lot of hope there. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Like, what do people think about like, like, like literary comics, like, <laughs> like, like Gabriel Bell or like Liana Fink or Ben's work or like literary. Yeah, what do you like think that, of Ben's work, everybody? <laughs> well, sorry, I, I didn't mean that. Coming up, but, but I mean, <laughs> but I mean, like, I, I feel like there's there's a way in which, like, there's some work being done in cartoons. My background's in, like, poetry, so I'm sort of a fan, artsy-fartsy kind of guy, but I feel like there's there's some work being done that, to my mind, seems, like, just as strong as, like, the best fiction being written. Like I'll read like Gabrielle Bell or Liana Fink and I'll be like, her voice is as strong as any of the fiction writers and she's drawing and she's doing narration. So it's like, I mean, I'm obviously, I don't know. I just feel well, like you there's- should, You should come to Ben's seminar every week because that's that's that, that's the- you know, that's I, I mean, I'm just gonna, there, there, there is a library of all the stuff you're talking about, Andrew. Like, like it's all out there. There's tons of this work, and and <clears throat> check out what the mill's doing and Jennifer and I. I'm constantly looking for new stuff. There's this guy named Robert Sergel who does this comic called Is, is that a Excuse? Um, it's okay. okay. It's like Gesundheit. Um, but 
it, it's fantastic. In, and, and I'm constantly looking for alternative thought in comics. And yeah, man, like it's all out there. There's no, and, and I know Gabrielle Bell and I love Leona Fink. Like, you know, yeah, man. But, but I also love a great superhero comic. You know, I still dig that stuff. And I, I, make, them, I, I, I make them all myself. I'm not saying I'm great. I'm just saying I, I get a little bored or I'll, I'll do like the Red Hook, but then I'm going to do something different next. Or before that, I worked with John Denaines and Harvey Picard and Inverna Lopez on literary comics. So it, it, the library is out there. We, we have the stories. This is, this is the golden, this is the new golden age of comics that Will Eisner evangelized for. This is, this is why Will didn't want to take the job as editor-in-chief of Marvel, because he, he saw a future for comics that was so diverse you know, and you go to any a comic shop or bookstore or you'll find the expression Amazon and, and you'll see, you know, what Will, it's Will Eisner's world, really, you know, I mean that. Uh, and, and speaking of Ben Catcher, one of my favorite cartoon cartoonists of all time, honestly. Uh, and I know Ben doesn't. Yeah, the, you know, the difference is in in Eisner's time, a cartoonist wouldn't be that pretentious to say they were making literary comics. Right. Which made them. And right. that's the difference. There's now a whole academically trained world of cartoonists. Right. Who for you know, it's uh these are like social reasons. They're positioning themselves as literary producers rather than entertainers. But doesn't mean it's uh Good or literary? I mean, that's just how you. Ben, like you have that book, like the the um, the dairy restaurant. That's like, um, it's not a, even a comic strip. It's a I know, but it's like it's it's book. like uber sophisticated. I mean, it's like it's like halachic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a just a text image kind of book. It's not a. But anyway, it, it opened up. Um, you know these popular when all of these popular forms even movies when they start being studied in universities people uh want to have different kinds of careers they don't want to be at the bottom of the barrel of commercial art which is where cartoonists were they want to be they want to start off you know with their college degree somewhere else so uh they that's just how they're going to uh position themselves but it doesn't mean uh that's not it's not that easy otherwise it'd be you know every mm -hmm. comics course would be producing amazing things and then you know it's still the odds are pretty rare for something really good to have but but, but there is an audience but both, both, both but will heroes yeah. what? but both will and stan publicly stated they had literary aspirations and they didn't understand why comics were, weren't seen this way, particularly in their older years. I so many times Will said the words literary, like, like I, I like, and I think that fight to make the low art high art, and it was always high art, but the, to have the world see it as high art, mm -hmm. I think that fight that, that Will gave and Jack and Stan is why their work goes above and beyond because they they, they they had a goal of oh i'm going to prove to you that mm -hmm. this is better than all those other books you read and by and the yeah. only way i can prove it is by doing it and i think that's why these books last as long as they do and why they go from generation to generation i agree i mean and i i have a certain i enjoy hearing your news i wonder am i i'm, I'm talking okay i enjoyed hearing your news that and i enjoyed what you said about how this medium is now medium, how this is now where it is. And that we're seeing this incredible just blossoming uh, of the interest in it. And that's so exciting. And then when you, Dean said, um, you said uh, image is text. I thought, no, 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 because I have a different perspective. I discovered a lot like Jennifer who said, I loved comics when I was a kid and then I left them. I wasn't with them and then I came back to them. I went to uh, graduate school at, at an ancient age. I started schooling at 40 and I was in graduate school uh, by, I guess I was 47. 
and um, everybody was young. And I, so when I started school to get my BFA, there were no comics classes of any kind, nothing. There was an uh, animation class. And this is the School of the Art Institute, which is kind of a very, it's a very ivory tower institution in certain ways. And, um, you know, artistically here in Chicago. And by the time I left, there was one. And now there are more than 30. I mean, there mm -hmm. has been this just mm -hmm. incredible yeah. change. But I experienced um, some very important people telling me that comics was not literature and that I could never have an agent as a comics artist. They just would mm -hmm. never talk to me because I was something lower than, you know, dog poo. And I just, uh, I found it's, it's so interesting that we have seen this incredible shift. And uh, so the school actually had me come after really maybe not being as uh, engaged with what I was doing, although they allowed me to turn my favorite thing as monsters in as my thesis, which I thought was very big of them. And it caused a little bit of uh, upset at that time among traditional writers who felt that that was a bad thing. And so we've seen just this incredible, just in my little lifetime. And I really have to say, I mean, if we're doing that, we're standing on the shoulders of people like Will Eisner and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, so many others, so many others. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I feel an enormous amount of gratitude to him for maintaining the absolute truth. And that was, and you see it in, in everyone's work who's shown something here, that this is literary work as well as everything else, you know? It, it, it has value. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm gonna steal what Dean said. I'm going to be using that. I'll, I'll give you some credit too, uh, I promise. But that, <laughs> that uh, image is text is so important to me. Uh, I think we as visual people who pe really are inspired by the visual, we know this is true. And we're, we're exposing the world to that truth. I love that. Thank you. And, and again, Will didn't, Will didn't really see any, any dividing line between the words and the pictures. He saw them all as one. Well, it's, it's story. It's all story. It's all story. And I, I keep wanting to bring up this guy who belongs in this discussion, for me, always belongs in a discussion of comics, and it's Charles Dickens. He was my idol when I was in college. I read every one of his books, even though I couldn't get into the classes I wanted necessarily. And I, his delineation of character, his understanding of the cycle of humor and tragedy, going back to humor, going back to tragedy, the way he could mesh um, plot together and the way he basically mimicked um, uh, movie making was so amazing to me. And now, and now he's somebody I'm sure would love to read my work. I would hand it to him and he would say, uh -huh. yes, let's have a beer, whatever he drank. Let's have a mold something or other. Oh my God. Anyway, I, his, his thing was he understood theater. He, he, I read somewhere that he couldn't make up his mind whether to be an actor or a writer. And he, he missed an audition and didn't get a part. And he said, well, the hell with it, then I'll be a writer. But when you read his writing, you know that he is acting every single part. And not just by giving the person a, a, a speaking tick um, and a, a description uh, and an incredible name to go with them, but every, um, but the, the feeling that is, that is coming up in every one of them, the, the feeling that he, and their role in the story. There was a time when I could, you could name any minor Dickens character and I could tell you which story he was in because I could remember, I could still map how it fit into an, uh, like an 800 page novel. And I just, um, I, Dickens is regarded as literary. I regard him as an entertainer. Uh, yeah. a fabulous entertainer. He had the whole package in his books. Well, and, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, he so, stood in front of people and I, and read. He, you know this, though. I'm sure you do. He stood for hours. He, yeah. he a marathon. Yeah. So he, actually, he, he was right. combining it. And when you were talking about Eisner's father being a set, set designer, was it, or a set painter? A painter. Yeah. I was thinking about how the characters that Eisner draws are so, uh, you can see him saying, okay, it's this guy. And he always gets all the features repeated exactly right. And this guy is gonna, is gonna come on stage and he's gonna do this. And, and I think the best, some of the best storytellers have that theatrical quality to them. 
Well, I, I would also add to um, uh, what, what, what he showed us is that comics are on some level a bastard art form. They really thrive and survive when people bring stuff from outside of comics into it, right? I, I, uh, I had heard Sting say this about rock and roll, that when rock and roll uh, is just people repeating some song that they heard, eh, but when people reach out and they bring opera in or jazz in or R&B, something exactly. else starts to bubble. It starts to become wildly more successful and it's still rock and roll. And it, it occurred to me that comics were, were very similar, that all of my heroes had pulled something from their life from outside of comics into comics, right? And for Will, obviously theatricality and lighting as he had brought up, but the the, you know that that became the foremost part of the study is that part and then applying it to the storytelling and uh, and comics, comics does that yeah. comics is rock and roll because it's a vernacular form it's a vulgar form that became you know now it's being academicized whatever you want to call it i mean there's the study of comics has its own language i watched a presentation and i was like this is not even this is not remotely comics anymore this is everything that comics isn't but once but it wouldn't exist if it weren't you know if comics hadn't arrived comics has arrived you know oh, yeah. and it doesn't have to worry about it at all yeah but yeah, but the, in the way that rock and roll has arrived people are studying rock and roll the same way yeah but, but yeah and it, all both are low arts that became high arts in our lifetime Right, celebrated yeah. art forms instead of put that away. Yeah. It's it's somebody discovering something in a form that you think you know, and then there's some. Then suddenly there's something added or something mm -hmm. uncovered, or, or or something that's somehow hybridized. And suddenly, that's what art is, right? That's what that's what what genius is is finding that thing, you know, that that makes it come alive in a different way. Yeah, um, there's a <laughs> common. There's a comment by Jim Salakrup. Is that a firsthand information you had from Eisner about his, uh, Jim? That does true. Yeah. You're, you're muted, Jim, you have to unmute. I got it. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it, it's, uh, he, he, yeah, he, he talked about that. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he loved comic book stores. He loved uh, comics in general, but there was a uh, part of him, Danny could talk about it, that wanted to be really taken super seriously. Well, there, <laughs> there, there, there's a, David Haydu did an, an interview with Will that was printed in Comic Book Artist when Will died. You know, David Haydu wrote the Tencent Plague. He wrote that book about um, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and uh, a lot of other great stuff. And um, I think they were at a Barnes and Noble, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically David says to Will, Will, isn't this amazing? It's everything you ever wanted. Not only is there a graphic novel section, but within the graphic novel section, there's a Will Eisner section. <laughs> and Will goes, yeah, it's okay. But I should be over there with Bello and Malamud and, uh, and, and I.B. Singer. I should be with the Jewish American novelists, you know, I mean, it's fine to be here in the comics, but that's what I'm doing. I'm doing uh, literature like that, and I should be shelved with them. So yeah, that, was, that was Will's, uh, I think that's what, you know, his, am, his ambition, although, you know, obviously he loved, you know, his medium was comics, you know, that uh, he, used to, he used to say something like, um, I took a, I took a halfway competency in writing and a halfway competency in art and made them into like a high competency in, 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 in sequential art. Where I think he was being a little disingenuous, but you know, but yeah, he, yeah, that is what, that, that is what he saw for himself. And that was, I think his highest hope for the medium. And you can really, in the, in the piece that you chose Jennifer to highlight, you can see the short story quality in the non-resolution of that particular story. But, and yet, because the drawing is so potent, you have so much more than perhaps you'd get from a short story. I mean, you have another level of, of you know, graphic mystery in Thank that you. story. 
And I, I like that. I enjoyed the fact that you pointed that out. And I think that's really an important quality that he, he didn't always uh, resolve his stories in a way that was uh, expected or, you know, you, you were left thinking about it beyond because you had to say, well, what did happen? And that just is so generous in a way. It allows you to be a part of the story and, and come to it and, and, and decide and be inspired. You know, I like that. And I like that in a well, lot the whole, of- The whole storytelling thing is so mysterious because why are we telling these stories? Well, we wanna, you know, we wanna get our own uh, bugaboos out, but mostly I sit down to write a story because I wanna know what I think about what happened. And then, in, and then, it, it, and then if you can keep it open, you know, then there's always ambiguity to life. And then uh, other people's interpretation of the story can come in. I'm doing that now in a story mm -hmm. and, and I can't include all of the stuff, but I'm like, where can I, where can I snip it and have it still be there, but not be formed so that it can be anything to anybody depending on, you know, their, their need, their, what they're hearing, what they're feeling. Yeah. I love, the, I love the editing process, though, because I think that the things you don't say are, are really behind what you do say. And nobody sees it, maybe, ever, but there's a substance that's accrued to the reality of it for you, and you manifest it in a non, in, in, in a way I don't even know if you, like I would ask you, Brian, when you're developing characters, do you do a lot of writing beyond what we see and hear? That we never oh, I, I mean, oh I would God, think you yeah. do because I, <laughs> I have that sense about them that they're much more dimensional. I mean, I do actually with everyone here, you know, I have that sense that there's more. And I guess I would ask that question of Ben and Dean and Jennifer too. Do you do, do you write a lot more than we're ever going to see? Uh, I think about it. Some of it is just a facade. You feel, you, figure out ways to make it feel like that. Like there's this depth of um, understanding, but I think it's whether you really have to do it all, uh, no, then it's, you'd never get anything done. I mean, it's an, it's an illusion of that depth for me. I, yeah, I don't, I, um, I think it's more, yeah, but that's what it, how it works for me. I don't have to, know you know where somebody went to public school and work out their whole life it's just it's uh, more of a trick i think I, I, um oh go ahead go ahead no no please go ahead well i was just gonna say really quickly because i i come at comics as an artist first and then uh because i never felt confident as a writer and then little by small i started to realize wait comics is writing <laughs> drawing comics is writing in a lot of ways and I'm sure Brian can speak to this when he works with other artists, what they bring to the table, what they bring to the story, you know? So I started thinking, oh God, I, maybe I should try to write some stuff. And, you know, you can be verbose or you can forget to add certain things or there's pacing issues, whatever, but we all learn in public as creators and artists and writers, we're growing up in public, you know? So you can go back and see our earlier works. And I know it makes me cringe um, to see what I did something last year, okay? But, um, you know, I, I, it, it, in terms of like developing character or I think sometimes you'll write a character that you just know and you don't need to write their backstory what they ate for lunch. You just know that character. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, you will create a character and you're not quite sure. So you might base it on your friend or that person or someone you know, or you go on Wikipedia or you go online and you, you do about two hours worth of, you know, excavating and then you might be able to build a character that way. Um, but also I write plays and my newest play that was postponed because of COVID in March of 2020 is supposed to come out hopefully this fall. Um, the, 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 the newest version starts with the second act that I wrote. So there's about 20 pages that I, I really liked. And I was like, you know what? I don't think I need this because we cover some of that stuff later mm -hmm. on and people can catch up. You know, storytelling has changed a lot. You know, one of the things that Marvel and DC Comics taught uh, people who watch television is how to keep up with the, the never ending story. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a lot of things are, you talk about decompression, right, Brian? Like, like taking a story that when we were kids, you would get an epic 22 page story. Now you take that 22 pages and you turn that into six issues, right? But you can add more stuff to epic it. Epic six issues. Not six, five? No. <laughs> 
Epic. No, just epic. Yeah. No, it's an epic, epic six year. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, but yeah, it's it, and and that's also because of manga, which is a whole other conversation. I feel like manga uh <laughs> kind of decompressed storytelling. Um, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it, it, it's what serves the story at the end of the day, you know, and then, and then, you know, what do you put in that's fun, but maybe not necessary to the quote plot, but now character is kind of taking over plot in a lot of ways these days, where people are just more interested with hanging out really with fun characters. And because we've seen a lot of the stories that have happened, the, more, the older you get, you can kind of guess what's going to happen next. Or if you're paying attention you know, you can figure certain things out, but it's really like who you're hanging out with and 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 who you want to watch something happen to. Yeah, we're we're living, we're creating in a universe completely different than the one Will Eisner was creating those graphic novels in. Completely yeah. different. Number one, you just said it, but it's more uh, uh, pandemic related, even more so. People have cons people now consume more story than any generation that came before them. And, and funny, yeah. like, like yeah. Robert McKee talks about this in, in, in story, that book's like 25 years old. Like, more people watch more story. <laughs> you feel like watch two hours of story a week. And now it's up to eight hours of story a week. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think it's like eight hours a day now, like for some people, they just get constantly bombarded with story. And with that comes an evolution of language because the audience then starts to reject certain things that were needed back in the day that are not needed anymore. You see a simplification of storytelling, even from an Instagram like story, like, oh, I, I get the, I get everything about this person from this two second clip, nope. right? And that affects the way stories are being told and the way stories are being consumed. I, I'm absolutely fascinated by that. Yeah, you know? and does this cause people to draw closer together, do you think? Because there's more shared um, there's more shared information. I mean, it's profound sharing if you're all invested in these same stories. Well, Emil, you, you talk about empathy before, which is so important. And I think that's what helps empathy is the fact that uh, there, there is a, what do you call it? Uh, the, 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 the field has been flattened. Everyone uh, has a voice. Everyone has access to having a voice, you know, basically, right? Uh, it's called the internet, you know, or your phone. And there are so many ways to express yourself. And a lot of people are taking advantage of that and doing that to the point where it's just become a huge deluge, right? Like, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with all the great TV shows that are coming out, you know? I, and then we live in a spoiler world these days and whatever. That's a whole other conversation. But but the, like you saying, Brian, like the Instagram. Sled. What? Rose Don't you do sled. it, Jenny. <laughs> But also, you know, like, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, like I, I, my background is in poetry, and like I think, like poetry is behind the times, because poetry became this sort of insular thing, where it it didn't reach out beyond the bounds of its community, and I mean, like I love John Ashbery, but like you know the American public doesn't read John Ashbery, right? I mean, John Ashbery is like a sort of very rare talent. Um, but like stories, like you guys are saying, like stories have a way of reaching people. Um, and there's something like, you know, the graphic novel, for example, it fires on many cylinders. You know, it's not just language, it's language, images, and storytelling. But it's 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 a deliberate form, right? So it's like it's not. It's a multimedia discipline comic. Yeah, and it's not like a passive. I mean, you can you can you know sit in a in a crappy movie and just like veg out. Same yeah. with TV. But like if you read you know some of these literary comic books, like I mean. I mean, like they have the, the qualities of literature. Like you know, if you take a literature class, let's say one aspect of literature is like polysemy like many levels of meaning like mm -hmm. that happens in in these literary i mean you know but i also i also would ha i would hazard to say for me i don't care if comics are literature i don't care if my work is literature you know and one thing i wanted to mention earlier was um and there's a handful of cartoonists a lot of cartoonists but what was great about eisner's work is that not only did it let's say entertain which means give you a value where you're like consuming and and enjoying or you know even if it's you cry or you laugh whatever but it also educated the form 
Like you can read um, Eisner comics for what he's trying to convey, but also you can learn how to make comics by reading his comics. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I just learned something you know, just now. I mean, that hat hung up in no space at all on that one comic. I was just like, okay, that's blowing my mind. I'm going <laughs> to have to go back and look at this again because that hat, you know, when I was a little kid, my father took me to the museum. He, he's, he, he was a wonderful artist. He's, he's my D's really truthfully, but he, um, he took me and he showed me um, a Delacroix painting where the whole painting uh, needs this one slipper. And if you took the slipper away, he put his hand up and he said, you take that slipper away from this fight between all these creatures and these men on horses. You put your hand there, it doesn't work, see? And right. he shows me this and I'm like, I guarantee you, you put your hand up on that hat and that whole page doesn't work. And I was and like- that's what I was saying where, where, where object is character, which leads to story. And ultimately what we're all trying to do, I don't care what the genre is, whether it's memoir, science fiction, you know, whatever. Uh, it's all about connecting with humanity. You know, it's it making a human connection. I know that my work isn't done. The, the period to my sentence is when you read it. That's mm -hmm. me. And whether you like it or not, at that point, doesn't matter. That's the difference. It's just getting to you. That's, as communication artists, that's the whole point, is try to get to you with something I did or what you did. And then we're communicating and connecting somehow for good and for bad, you know? Yeah, yeah. I would bring okay. one more thing into uh, one characteristic of Will Eisner's work that uh, is morality. That he, his characters live in a moral universe. And uh, I, was a, I was a student of John Gardner, the author who wrote on moral fiction and who was probably attacking people like uh, Tom Wolfe for an amoral universe uh, in that. And he felt that one of the functions of fiction was, and art in general was to, to teach, to be a lesson. It didn't have to necessarily come out that the good guys win, but it, there had to be some something under, underlying it. And I think that's uh, very true of Lyle's well, work. You said human. He, he was a humanist. He, he really, yeah. he, even his bad guys had human characteristics to them and that they weren't super villains. They were they were torn they, with the exception perhaps of the octopus uh well, well you're bringing up something that someone else brought it up before is that the, uh, some anger inside some of these books you know some genuine rage at the lord almighty um you know he had a tragedy in his life and it rocked him to his core and he could not answer the questions that he was facing and he turned to his first love of comics to try to work that out and I think the reason mm -hmm. it works so well is that the questions are asked. No answers are given because there's no answers to be given. But the mm -hmm. question is the answer. Just asking the question yes. is yes. the answer. And, and there's a lot of authors who have done similar things. But when you, uh, if, I, if I can plug it one more time to watch this documentary about uh, the portrait, they, they talk about this a little bit, about how he wouldn't talk about his daughter mm. out loud but wrote these elaborate graphic novels about how he felt about it and mm -hmm. that his friends and family would often be like, Jesus, like, oh, okay, he's, he's working it out, right? And I've, I've had friends and family who've done the same thing in their work and it's always uh, startling and you're so, so grateful that they have an outlet in which to ask impossible questions or, or, or the bravery to ask impossible questions too. I love that what you just said, which was, the uh, answer is that you've asked the question. I think that's how you said it. I love that. Kinda, I really yeah. think that's, uh, I like that. I and may then, have stolen it from problematic Oliver Stone. But good, still. also ah. new. So then it would be, you know, okay. be like, okay. and it's, it, it, it's funny what you said, you know, about poetry. Cause I, about 25, maybe 25 years ago, if people would have said, well, what's the state of, what's the state of the comics? I was thinking the same thing. Business. Go, well, it's kind of like poetry. There's some hardcore, dedicated readers, you know, like opera, <laughs> like poetry. It's never going away. But then, you know, I think this is, again, the world that will help to jumpstart to the point where you have people in Tennessee upset about comic books. That means they're noticing comics. Which is a great thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing that 25, 30 years ago you know, it, it, it probably would have gone, I mean, the times are different, you know, in a lot of ways, but 
but kind of comics were heading in that in what you in what you describe about poetry and and thanks to a lot of the people on the screen here that they're they're you know and starting with Will and you know that they, they're now you know although you know I mean I don't know that you know when my when my relatives uh, you know no longer think that me working in comics is just cute when I when I when I when I can go to a family function and not have people go oh that's very cute that Danny's working in comics for the past 40 years you know but but I think it's getting you know I think that was Will you know you know the Tennessee thing and all and all those bannings are, are terrible obviously but it means somebody's noticing that, that comics so are there. We've gone from comics not in schools to comics in schools to people fighting for comics in schools <laughs> right in, in in the last 10 years yep. so it's kind of crazy do you have a question Someone has their hand up. Oh, yeah. Who is that? Raphael. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes. Hi. Uh, I, I don't mean at all to derail this fascinating, uh, illuminating, phenomenal conversation. Uh, thank you all so much for doing this and for your amazing respective bodies of work. But uh, I just wanted to, to mention here, again, not wishing to derail, um, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm an opera singer, I'm a professional opera singer, but uh, I'm a lifelong lover of the comics medium and something that you all have touched upon and uh, at various points in this conversation, the theatricality of Mr. Eisner's work, the fact that his father uh, painted scenery, I had no idea of that, um, but also specifically Mr. Haskell, you mentioned, uh, or many of you may have mentioned this, um, the, the synthesis of, uh, you know, text and, and imagery and storytelling. Um, I just wanted to mention that you all have uh, given me an epiphany in this moment because uh, I'm about to go into a very long rehearsal process. And right now, a lot of the things as I'm preparing, I'm, I'm gonna sing the role of Don Jose and Carmen. Um, I've got text on a page. I've got uh, you know musical notation on a page. I've worked with uh, my fellow pianist collaborators, uh, trying to uh, rehearse before showing up with all the cast and the, the scene builders and the orchestra musicians, everything. But that synthesis isn't gonna happen until we get on the stage. And um, the way that you all have spoken about Mr. Eisner's work, about the synthesis of all these different, um, uh, different aspects uh, this magnum opus that he would create. Sorry if I'm rambling on a little bit, but I just, I'm a little nervous to speak to you all. <laughs> but, can, you sing, um, can you sing us your question? <laughs> I, I'm act, I mean, I'm right here in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I, I just, uh, Mr. Bendis, uh, hi, Mr. Bendis, uh, can't wait for Phenomena. Really excited. Uh, well, thank you. Enough said, uh, I, I could go on. But uh, talk about it being a bastard medium. Um, I actually, because I tour with Chris Bode, the, the, the jazz trumpeter, I got to actually mention that to Sting in person one time. I don't know, he, you know, he wouldn't know me from Adam, but, but uh, that, that just kind of changed my world, specifically your paraphrasing of it. I just wanted to thank you all um, because I have to tell you that as an opera singer, there are so many times when um, you know, it's, it's this medium that you, you mentioned to people and they, not without good reason sometimes, sometimes the opera community does this to themselves. It's like, I don't want to go to the opera. I mean, what, you know, what's that? Um, likewise, uh, you know, I say, hey, I'm really excited about this comic. Can I show you a comic? What are you talking about? Which it should not be that. We know it's high art, but like you said, Mr. Ben is bringing it up. Um, forgive me for rambling. Um, I just, uh, this was really, really deeply inspiring. Um, Mr. Eisner, when, when I saw, I remember the first time that I saw one of the, the spirit splash pages, the title pages, it's the first time that I can recall uh, as a musician, this was before I even had a career in opera, um, recognizing a lyrical quality of a sequential story being told in one singular image and one, I, I don't even want to use the word panel, but here's this text and it's, uh, that 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 blew my mind. I, I could not believe that it sticks with me. It it, it uh, uh, haunts me, rattles me to this day. Um, but uh, you know, here I'll, I will sing something for you if you want. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. this um, uh, this this panel was so great. I'm inspired. 
I promise that I'll wrap this up quick. And I <laughs> shall remember this for a long time. Thank you all so much. Uh, you all rock. My, 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 my father, the cantor who had uh, operatic ambitions is applauding you from beyond. Thank you. Oh, God bless you. God <laughs> bless you. That means a lot. <laughs> Hey, but Thank Raphael, I, I will say, everyone, I, I think I can speak from everyone. We all look outside of our medium for inspiration, for the creative journey that others go through. I'm hyperly obsessed with comedy writers and what their journey is. And mm -hmm. I know it's I'm talking to myself. So what you're doing, I completely uh, uh, appreciate and experience it all the time. Like just getting blown away by something completely out of my wheelhouse and take it right into my wheelhouse see what I can do with it. So thank Absolutely. you for that. Absolutely. You. Raphael, I want you to, I want you to go look for this book. Yes, I, uh, Peter Van Russell. Absolutely. I've been waiting for a reprint that doesn't cost a hundred dollars. I, I just, I, uh, if I didn't mean to cut you off, uh, I'm singing uh, Zalome uh, with Houston Grand Opera coming up. They just announced a season. I just picked up Pete Craig Russell's. That's one of the few opera adaptations of his that I hadn't read. And, and um, uh, Arizona Opera that I just sang a main stage role with, they're doing an opera, uh, uh, an adaptation of Carmen that Mr. Russell is doing the layout for with Aneke. So anyways, I don't mean to derail. I, I can't wait to uh, revisit the, the ring of the Nibelung. Yeah. Are you going to be, are you, are you, did you say you're singing in Houston? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, Houston Grand Opera, I'm, I'm part of their upcoming season. I've got a couple of main stage roles with them. Wonderful. I have to check you out when we go down to Houston. Thank right. you. Oh, yeah. And, and Mr. Bennett, want to mention I, we I, I, met. We met at South by Southwest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you. All right, oh, very man. good to see you again. I uh, uh, I framed. Uh, I, I don't want to derail any further, but the <laughs> Ultimate Spider-Man '78. There's an amazing monologue that you have uh, a singer talk about Will Eisner relating his music to that. That touched me in my heart. I've still got it with me. Got a, a, an original page by Mr. Bagley, inks by Scott Hanna. It's hanging in my room next to uh, all of uh, my my opera, you know. Uh, anyways. Uh, you know, you know Thank you. Name, you know, you know <laughs> conductor named Rico Sakani that you ever come across that guy? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. You know a conductor named Rico Sakani? You ever come across no, that guy? No, I've, I've heard that name, but I haven't had the pleasure of uh, working. Uh, it's fine. I, I know him from a long time ago. And maybe we should uh, let people go home. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. We ended up on a song. We're in opera. I just, I just want to wrap up. It is Will Eisner week. Um, so um, please, there are many, uh, lots and lots of events. Uh, Emil, with, with your signal from space, uh, and I'll use that as a, just to get a plug in. Michael Dooley is here. Maybe Michael can put a link. Uh, we, on, on the 7th, uh, Ari Kaplan and I and Michael are doing a uh, comparison of uh, Will Eisner and Orson Welles. Mm -hmm. And we did that for, for you about six, seven years ago. It's new, updated, better than ever. But um, when I saw that Signals and Space stuff, I realized I have to redo the whole presentation to fit that in because, you know, that, that was, you know, so much of Welles is, uh, is of course, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the invasion from Mars. Um, and then I realized, oh my God, Eisner not only spooked Wells in the 40s, but then he did outer space stuff again yeah. in the 70s and 80s. So I, I, I um, but uh, Michael, if you can quickly put the link or people can contact me or Michael. Um, I, I just want to thank Brian mm -hmm. and Emil um, and Jennifer and of course, Dean. Um, what a night, holy cow. Uh, and all the great questions. Ben, thank you for hosting thank this. You. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank we you. Will. Next year. Thank you. Thank you. Conversation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Very nice. Take care. Everybody stay well and stay safe. Hey, everybody. Yes. Yes. Whoever's interested, next week, a uh, young cartoonist, Dustin Holland, talking about oh. his work. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you. Good See night. You next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye, everybody.